Greetings, future fossils. This is Michael Garfield welcoming you to another episode of the podcast that explores our place in time. I have to apologize to everyone for missing a week in the programming schedule, but I, I seriously tried to get this episode out on time. Uh, this last week, my partner and I moved from Austin, Texas to Santa Fe, New Mexico, so that we can start a family here and I can work full time at the Santa Fe Institute without losing my mind going back and forth between Santa Fe and Austin every two weeks. So here we are and um, lots of exciting developments on the horizon, but I think I did learn a thing or two about my limits this week uh, in between closing shop in Austin and uh, loading and unloading a 15 foot U-Haul. Although admittedly we had a lot of help from our wonderful friends. But if you ever want to know what it's like to lose your mind trying to figure out how to fit a 1950 square foot rental into a 570 square foot rental, I'm your boy. <laughs> so anyway, it is with great pleasure that I offer this second part of this wonderful conversation with John David Ebert, Michael Aaron Kamins, and Ikiyu Sojin. Uh, obviously, that is a pseudonym, a reference to the rebelliously sensual Zen monk. At any rate, three very smart and interesting guys who, when we sat down in person, uh, wonderful things emerged out of it. And it's a real pleasure to finally get to see this one through. Uh, but first, I want to give a quick shout out to the new Patreon supporters, as as well as people who have upped their Patreon pledges. Uh, Jed Disentrope, Darren Basil, Ben Lockhart, and Rian Bevan. Thank you all so much, uh, as well as to the folks who have been sending one-time donations to at future fossils on venmo uh, that was really sweet to wake up to that wonderful message this morning thanking me for the podcast so those of you who have been tracking this show know that i have a grown-up job now for the first time in my entire life i'm not simply relying on subscriber gratitude to survive uh, but my life is much, much fuller than it used to be, and it's getting harder and harder to find the time to continue putting out the show on a regular basis. And the more folks are helping subsidize the extraordinary time and energy it takes to release every one of these episodes, uh, something on the order of you know, 5 to 15 hours a week, realistically, just to record and, and edit and publish everything. Not to mention the time it takes to research the guests and to uh, inspire them to appear on the show. And if I were not so grateful to the restaurant full of people that are paying for this podcast every month, I don't know that I would feel a, a serious responsibility to continue. I mean, frankly, I'm kind of over the conceit of this show that it is primarily for a large but unborn audience, and I'm really interested in cultivating something wonderful with the living listeners that I have. On that note, our first Patreon sci-fi book club discussion, exploring the wonderful, freaky, totally subversive and challenging work of science fiction, Blind Sight by Peter Watts, will be on January 31st. I think we'll probably hop on a Zoom call for about two hours, maybe more, to talk about that book. And everyone who supports the show on Patreon is welcome. So uh, for more information, hop on over, drop in two bucks or whatever. Uh, you can always cancel after the book club meeting if you decide we're a bunch of fools. <laughs> or, uh, you know, or just stay on it. And it would be great to have you in that conversation because I think... Discussing sci-fi is a fantastic way to anchor and apply all of the philosophical ideas that we discuss in this show. What kind of futures we really want to help usher into being, uh, if that's even a correct way of thinking about time. I'm not convinced it is due to a decade-long preoccupation with the evidence for 
retro causation, uh, if that's even the right way of thinking about that. Anyway, you're all wonderful. I adore you. And enjoy this episode. It's it's fantastic. So, <laughs> thanks and enjoy. So we're talking about snow crash and the decay of language and how like having a universal translator allows everyone to have their own language. And oh, interesting, yeah. You know, and so you get you get to a, a point where you've sort of taken the the epistemological question as far as you can possibly take it in terms of like are other people are other entities conscious? You know, because yeah. I mean, that's the that's I think I think that's what's going on with this the, this being the hardest question to come out of DMT space. Like, are these things so really questions? Are these things really aliens? Mm-hmm. You know, are these things really like are these things really there, or are they in in a sort of Jungian, not Jung, but Jungian sense, right? Mm-hmm. That these gods are most people are are, are <coughs> sort of want to misinterpret that as being that the gods are Reductive merely parts of our own yeah like, the, the, uh, merely of you know, something so being projected so I was talking to John about there's this another way that, that, that archetypes are like living beings right that's how Crowley yeah. saw them in the tarot deck he saw that so there's so the thing is like if you buy into a non-duality there's no difference between the inside and the outside so you have the inside uh, Jungian projection and you have the outside uh, distinct alien or whatever things yeah, projection, but really they could be just the same thing along this cycle that you're constantly experiencing. But but then you get into subtler questions about agency. Like it's still the case that if the thing is primarily just a symbol projected into your your virtual reality by your body, that it does in some sense live out outside of you. Like even if we're assuming non-duality, you still get into like causal sort of relationships within that, yeah. right? And so you, see, you can still ask like, so is this thing just, I mean, maybe it's the distributed agency of this landscape speaking through my body and therefore it's a, a, in a sense a uniquely human if you know, also transcendent thing. Mm-hmm. But, um, but then it's not necessarily like, the, the question remains like, is it conscious except mm-hmm. through me? And the answer in that case would be no. Mm-hmm. Whereas like, there's the sense in the, in the sort of more basic version of this conversation where it's like the simple, like the naive realism, like does it exist outside of me? Where it's like, if this thing, even though it is distributed, still has its own sort of agency, its mm-hmm. own consistent thing that is more than merely something that shows up for people. Mm-hmm. And that's what that's what Tim Morton's getting at with hyper objects. Right. You know, that's the question is like, you know, we basically can't answer that question. And so we're stuck uh, treating every object that we interact with as though it might be like the face of some deity that we we're not really capable of perceiving. See, well, James mm-hmm. Hellman would say that, that that's really important that we, that's what the psyche does, you know, and that that's what soul that's like, that's what yeah. you have to do that to have psychological life. You know, to mm-hmm. personify yeah, things. so that kind of actually reminds yeah. me of Taleb. You gotta avoid the risk of ruin on this particular subject. Say more. Um, man, it's hard to say. Well, it's it's almost like Pascal's wager, right? You have to avoid the risk of ruin by just up increasing the probability of your survival as oh. much as you can. So by going along with them as conscious, just accept that they're real, so that'll help you. Sur- you have a, like a dog going along with the, some new owners, so just go along with that they're going to feed you and take care of you, that we should just go along with these archetypal images. I, for one, welcome our new squid overlords. <laughs> squid overlords, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That shows up I like line. the flying pizza dude. You know, like, so, mm-hmm. What is that? The flying spaghetti monster. Yeah. Right? yeah. But, so yeah, I think there's something to that, although the question of like, what happens if you disregard the sapience of this table? I think most people are just going to like laugh at you. Uh, but maybe that's a sign of how crude we are. You mean that there's that they're going to laugh at you because there's no be- beings above the sapience at the table? You mean? Well, just that, just that, like you know, this line of reasoning gets us into some very like freshman dorm room mushroom trip kind of spaces where like my you know uh, you're, you're asking like. 
I'm aware of the mug, and the mug is aware of me. <laughs> you know, and I am just the mug experiencing itself. Some, something interesting that you might find interesting is that um, Akio was telling us about a DMT trip he had that featured a clown. And, 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 the, and the clown, and he'll tell you about it in a second, but the clown is this thing that shows up in all these DMT trips. Mm-hmm. And I just read this book, not by Michael Pollan, but by another another guy that just put out a book called It's, about, it's Psychedelics and, and the Outer No, Hulk. I don't want to do DMT. It's like, it's you ruined it for me because I, I don't want to see a clown. <laughs> yeah, so, so John, it imagine sucks, Mel man. Wolf, but like a thousand times more. Yeah, I really, let I'm me, sorry. Let me, well, let me set, let me set this is a great place to take this. Yeah, let me, set, let me just set it up and then the key will tell the story. And, me, and then me and John have this the whole archaeology of the clown. Right. John had this whole thing where the architect was. We architect. kid you not, the archaeology of the clown. I, I and Ma- I, Michael and I mapped it out yesterday. We need someone that can look up the name of the guy that wrote this book. Um, but he just it, the book came out recently. It's, I think it's called Other Worlds, and it's it's a book on psychedelics, but oh, on, yeah. on Psy. You it's, have that. You brought so it with you. Yeah, I did bring it with me today. It was the oh, one book okay. I didn't bring. And I'm right. like, why didn't I bring that with me? Okay, but um, that's all right. Don't worry. So he has a whole se- chapter on there about what this DMT creature is that people are seeing. And he saw it as well, and and trying to examine this clown type. Creature. So so have you seen this thing? <clears throat> I haven't seen it. Nikki you is <clears throat> in the you bathroom. Seen it? And I know other people who have He's seen done DMT, well. the actual Yeah, the actual 15 smokable minutes, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. compound. And <clears throat> did you encounter entities? I mean, I've encountered entities, but I actually haven't smoked DMT. But you have done yeah. he, he yeah. yeah. All right, all right. Uh, and there's this common the right, and so there's this common theme of the, the clown of the clown, you know, this clown archetype or whatever that he saw. And I know other people that saw it. McKenna talks about these machine elves that kind of sound like clowns, and then and then we start thinking about what what is the what is the clown? What is it even? What is the clown? As My a, guess as was Harlequin. The, the, and is uh, it a real being? Originated right? like an Italian comic Luke opera, Davis. you know, <clears throat> uh, as as Harlequin, and then it got passed over and westernized. I mean, I'm just making a guess. So okay, so talk about that because that's that's. Yeah, I want to hear. Well, the Harlequin store, the Harlequin is the figure who dresses in a motley outfit. Yeah. you know, it's all patchwork associated um, with the jester, the funny right? hat. Yeah. yeah, and he's sort of like the the, the funny figure in Italian comic opera. You know, he's he's always turning up. Picasso liked to paint Harlequin quite a bit, and uh, it's just this patchwork figure. It's like he's not there's a he's lacking wholeness. But for precisely that reason, he can say whatever he wants, and we give him permission to do. We compare that. him to the fool in the tarot oh, deck. Wow. Yes. Yeah, right. yeah, right. And the interest, and the Joker in the in the traditional card deck. And we were talking about this yesterday. The interesting thing, it's why it can do what it do is it, it, what it does is because it's not nailed down to any signified. All the rest of the pack is the series of fifty-two signifiers. Each one of them is nailed firmly to a signified. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can't mess with the meaning. But the Joker is the only one in games that allow the Joker, that uh, is a floating signifier. So you can plug him into any... And he messes with the meaning. ...sign regime that you want to. Um, so he's sort of already, like, looking ahead to this sort of postmodern, deconstructed, Derridian landscape where we get the sense that all the signifiers now have come unglued for, from their signifieds, and they're floating now. So we can... Uh, in, in the negative sense is that it represents the disintegration of our traditions, so we have to kind of be comfortable about letting all of that go. But on the other hand, it's a new opportunity to create new meaning systems out of these yeah. sliding signifiers that don't stick to signifies. We can do whatever we want with them. You also, so it's an opportunity. But I, you also said that means all signifiers become clowns, and Donald right. Trump is a clown, right? People yeah. compare him to a clown. Right. Uh, so when clown, I relate this right? I mean, that's to a more complete uh, political theory, there's a lot of people nowadays who are into free speech, who are also into this thing called patchwork, which is basically this decentralized system of city-states where each one of them have their own governance system. Sounds and, a lot like the post-American landscape of Snow Crash, which is not a pleasant place to be. Let's be clear about that. Right. You know, there's, there is that issue of... And I, I want to get back to clowns here for some strange <laughs> reason. <laughs> but but I, I know you can't stop thinking about it. The, yeah. Once it starts, the 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 clown. Clown. that's what the clown does. And it hijacks right. your brain. So this is when you map the clown onto the political system. That's what, what it is. Interesting. The, uh, yeah. the patchwork and the, the Trump. 
they're the same thing. Well, I mean, wouldn't you say like I mean, decentralization as a response to that yeah, sort so, of pathological so really, this is a, a symbolic look at how accelerationism formed, why they like Trump and they like the patchwork. It's all part of this uh, symbol system. But, you know, then you get into... This is the fool in the Crowley deck. For, oh, know. there's a tiger on that card, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but a lot of different animals. He, that's... That's um. He also looks like part. He looks like Zelda, by the way. The he green, does kind of, yeah. The green, the looks, so he looks like Ebola riding the tiger. So, so what is? Uh, tell us about your DMT trip. Oh man, it's like so. That was my second trip, and I had uh, my friend over, and he's a real interesting guy. Like I do all my trips with him. So he was my friend from. Uh, Wait, actually, I shouldn't tell, talk too much about it. Yeah, it's, it, he's, it, he's neither here nor yeah, here. We already know too much. Yeah, yeah, anyway. So so that was my second trip and his first trip. So we went to my room and we just took as many hits as we can. I think it was like three pretty big breath. And we were there for like 15 minutes. So I got into this room after being sent through the hyperspace. Got into this very concrete room and it's like... Eight dimensional non Euclidean geometry, and it's a lot of different colors. I think, man, they're all reflecting each other, so you see a lot of colors, but really there's like one theme to the color, which is I think mostly red, white, and black. But really, it's like all the colors were there, it's hard to describe. But anyway, this clown was jumping in and out of me, and but it's also kind of unfolding itself and folding back into itself at the same time in these weird fractal patterns in eight dimensional space and it's almost it's almost like Cthulhu in a way it's got the tentacles wrapping in and out of itself and jumping out in and out of me at the same time and that was the most terrifying experience of my life I've never felt fear like that ever and was this like a did you see this like a virtual landscape that like enfolded you? Um, I was in like, there. Like your uh, visual cortex has been hijacked somehow by the yeah, drug. Yeah, so th this is, so I should actually clarify, there's um, closed eye visuals and open eye visuals. So that was a closed eye visual. And But the thing is like, you almost feel like there's a force drag you into there that you shouldn't open your eyes. It's almost like your eyes are shut down by gravity and it, they're not allowed to open. And, it, and if you open your eyes, something bad's gonna happen to how, how you are in the DMT world. Mm. So it's almost like one of those uh, survival online game, online survival games. If you log off, your character's still there. That's why you gotta build a house around it. So it's like that oh, shit. So it's like, so it's like, man, if I open my eyes and log log out, some, someone's, the clown is just gonna get me and kill me in the game. It's like, fuck, I'm still dead. That's really interesting yeah. because I do think that I was the first my first experience with ayahuasca in Peru was actually two different nights in 2011 mm -hmm. and um, I have very little experience with this but like anyway out of that there was I encountered this uh, very different entity which is sort of I don't want to <coughs> get off this topic mm -hmm. and into the topic of clowns except for the fact that it was a mantis like creature and that's very often also reported from DMT. Abductions. And abductions. Yeah, mantis type stuff. And also that there are real living species of mantises that look like clowns because they're like oh, they're like they evolved to look like uh, like pet like orchids, like flower mm -hmm. petals. You know, and they're very popular on mm -hmm. on like Pinterest and stuff like that. You know, these these clown looking mantises. So that's just a weird mm -hmm. connection. But anyway, this uh, this being explained to me and, and John this is where I want to take every conversation and uh, uh, with the people who I feel like can hack it because um, this, you, I feel like you have the, the sort of study of uh, cultural matrices for me to make sense of this. Whereas like, for me, this was an experience that I've been plugging in cultural reference points to ever since, but I, right. I, I didn't have like a, a, a scaffold for this at first. And it was saying um, to me basically that that kind of extraterrestrial being that it is was actually appearing to me through projection from 
the like hot, dense plasma at the center of the galaxy, which is so hot and so dense and so highly uh, gravitic that no biological life could possibly exist there. But the electromagnetic fields of that are so complex that it generates like a holographic ecosystem of stuff in this superfluid matrix. Sheldrix is about the sun. And that there are basically like dragons on the sun and genies at the, that like the, the, the Ifrit are like so, real so you beings. So on your ayahuasca trip? Yeah, that it explained to me that it was basically of a class of beings that are like the beings of flame. But it appeared to me as molten metal. And it was basically saying that that's, that's our physical, our actual physical uh, reality is is of the like plasma, of, a plasma. plasma of molten metal at like unthinkable gravity. We've been talking about the plasma petro. We were, by the way. Yeah, yesterday we were talking about that. But they're saying, but we don't. The point being, he's like to to your trip. He was saying we don't. It was saying we don't experience ourselves in this way. Mm -hmm. We just appear to you in this way because you are colder and slower than we are. Mm -hmm. But you have a plasmatic component. Like you live on this planet with like an ionosphere and. Mm -hmm. Your bodies are made out of electromagnetic forces, right. and like you have an electromagnetic body, but because you live in a cold, slow place, your awareness and evolutionary trajectory has concentrated itself on the on the solid form of consciousness rather than on the plasma form of consciousness. Yeah. Dude, I'm visualizing all this. Man, this it looks like an Alex Gray painting. What, what you were just describing, and mm. the, the way he's got all the yeah, matrices. Yeah, and meanwhile, he's within like... Within matrices, within matrices. Meanwhile, this chrome, eyeless, eight-foot-tall chrome mantis, like black chrome mantis, is like piercing me with these like long, jo like jointless pinchers. Mm. Like, like just like, but it's doing, it's like helping me. You know, it's like, just hold still, we're it's like taking care of some yeah, shit like, for you. Yeah, here. So it's, it's, it's like cleaning me. Like, like, it's like surgery. Yeah, that's yeah. Sh shamanic. Yeah, yeah, and I think yeah. that your experience, this is the thing, is like, I think that Holy that shit, shit is going that, on. That might the be the same experience as yours, but I just interpret it a different way. Right, well, I, I think that the fact is that there are things jumping in and out so of us all the time. A, right, that that there are things that are like other things that are like performing surgery on us, but that when we get into these spaces, it's like, some of them, you're in it. You're trying to make dualistic sense of a non-dual experience, right? Yeah. Where like you yeah. don't actually have a boundary, and so what, when the more you try to enforce a boundary on that experience, the more it feels like a violation. This is amazing. You know, the more it feels like you're being attacked because those. That was the difference between yeah, my first yeah, and my second. Yeah, I think that might be it. DMT trip. Oh, oh, no, but oh you're helping me. I want to add. Oh, no, I'm being violated. I want to throw a difference in here. Okay. This, yeah, but I think there's a significance as to why it's perceived as a clown. Because a clown is also... Because it's funny, it but tickles, the, man. No, but if something jumps in out of you, clown, it fucking but the clown is satanic. <laughs> the clown tracks back to Mephistopheles and Lucifer. The clown is it's is awesome. evil, in a way. It's like that you're having an experience... And I'm not saying this in the sense that I think it's literally evil, but mm -hmm. in, in this Western tradition, the clown is... is That's uh, Mephistopheles. That's Lucifer that you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. That you know, that's, the that's what he would show up as. And John had this whole thing from Campbell that you're this. Yeah. So the archaeology of the clown goes further back from um, what was the one guy you were just saying? The courtship, court jester guy? Harlequin. 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 Yeah. And it goes back to what you were saying about shamans that shamans were uh, made into they clowns. They became the clowns. In, in Native American myth, the, like in, in Hopi. When the colonial. Myth, um, mm -hmm. The shamans uh, get delegitimized as clowns and they mm -hmm. appear as, as clowns because they're making fun of them. This discredited. Who's individual. making fun of that? They become the, the, the Hopi. The, the Hopi big ego. Mm -hmm. The you know the big other of the Hopi. It's, mm -hmm. it's super ego. But who regards making, these right. shamans as clowns? They're anarchic. They use that you, to they delegitimize them. Yeah. And to so, make them into a so joke. So delegitimize so them. The, the, so so the, very often, how many clowns do we have? Clown. Well, how many clowns do we have that are like? They're older gods that have been delegitimized, and they're inside right. there. This is what we we're trying so to do. So the clown is one way to yesterday. delegitimize a shaman. Yeah. It's one way to delegitimize or another another group. That, so that's what's in our Western control, clown? Not you pull that Western clown yeah. apart. <laughs> well, I mean, in one... It, it is. Hey. You're, fun, you're trying to be funny, but you're trying to do something important in society to communicate a message. Well, that's why comedians can get away with all kinds of stuff. They a fool card. They, can, right. they float around. Yeah. They can, they're supposed to have the license to do that. So I don't they, understand why they're all they're getting in trouble. The like, noblest yeah. trolls yeah. represent that. Mm -hmm. and then you have legit trolls also mm -hmm. that are just like... You know, they're walking anger boner. Probably like two years ago, I was trying to write this manual on how to do trolling properly. It's almost like this like 
tantra technique. It's like you got to troll in this right way to like, <laughs> so that you can actualize your goals and position yourself in a way where you are kind of exposed. I think you've taken troll techniques and made an art way. form out of it. You know, I've yeah, been yeah, watching your right. tweets. These and tweets it's like, are like the best. He's like inventing a new genre. And we, they're so good, I don't even want to tweet because it's like, Akuya's doing it for me. Yeah, he's perfect. Uh, that's yeah. yeah, 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 right. 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 so, so the hypermodern. So this technology. idea was kind of <laughs> yeah, right. somewhat right. confirmed exactly. because uh, this one guy on, he has a pretty good podcast too, by the way, so Vincent Horn. Okay, he, I know does, Vincent Horn. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so he, he actually liked that thread of mine saying how trolling is kind of like Zen meditation. That's well, awesome. Yeah, Vince, Vince and I are both uh, expats of the Ken Wilber integral scene, actually. We knew oh. each other living in Boulder. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I kind of are known. Because I know that he, he <laughs> tries to combine McLuhan and and Buddhism, but I didn't know about the Wilber thing. Yeah, well, you know. It's you lived like, up in Boulder for a while? For four years, yeah. Oh, I, I but, lived there for two. John did too. Yeah. Yeah. Which two? Uh, that would have been uh, 09 and 10. We were there at the same time. You're kidding me, really? No, I was you 2007 were... to 11. Oh my god, that's crazy. That weird. That is weird, yeah. It's life is stranger. The older I get, and I'm I'm gonna turn fifty this month, uh, the stranger it seems to me. You know, it, it's like you would think that it would be the opposite paradigm that as you get older you acquire this wisdom, you have this intelligence, and you, so you're figuring it out. But it's no, it's been the opposite. It's like it's getting more and more mysterious. It's like I'm trying to cover everything, but I can't it's the stuff that keeps happening, like that Uber driver that picked us up yesterday. Who had attended Pacifica Graduate uh, School? Oh, yeah. He was there for a while, and he was a young in. He's like, I know astrology. Yeah, that's where I was. It was, was <laughs> so random, right? It was just a random Uber driver, and, and the dude was yeah. totally into Joseph Campbell and astrology, and, and he knew it. He was talking about the transits. Well, well that's when you wonder: Did Google uh, like get? You know, extend what what hyper object extended its tentacles into the Uber algorithm, so that guy ended picking you up. It's a synchronicity. You know? yeah. It's a well, synchronicity. I'll go back to the idea of the clown. So, <laughs> yes. so oh, are you, are you, I know it's <laughs> you, it's the clown. It's a clown for a reason. So he like sticks to you. Well, it's because wait, so, what you said the, so, it's the devil because so, we're because we've yeah, we need to like put it somewhere. We, right. So my interpretation is it's not the devil. It's really. The cl clown is really the old wise man. He's the well, Taoist the yeah. sage. Yeah. Which uh, right, right. so there's this one archetype in uh, Taoism in like Chinese. Man, in the Christian culture. tradition, there's only one. That's it's Christ. Called, it's, be that's that called uh, the La Wan Tong, which is kind of like the old the old kid who's like he's like super wise, but he does like silly childish things, like Milton Erickson. Yeah. What was his name again? What what? The the little the boy that you were just talking the name? Is there oh oh that's it's not a it's not a one character, it's a archetype, I think. What's it what's this, what's it called? You Law one tone. Law and one tone. Law. Law one yeah, tone. Okay. Yeah. And he's like the trickster archetype? Uh not not exactly trickster. Well I guess it could be. But like this always this very, very old person who's probably like hundred and fifty years old, who is the long uh, white beard, long white hair. So, like, Drunken yeah. Master is an example yeah, yeah, of that. Yeah, oh, that's great. yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's the Lao archetype. Yeah. yeah, It's one of the major archetypes in China. Yeah, and that's the when you have yeah. old man. Yeah, that and, whole uh, thing, like, shut up, old man, what do you know? No, but they don't, like, that's yeah, a different world up. over there. They're like, yeah. speak, old man. You know? Yeah, it's exactly. Except for the <laughs> old man is actually the child. He Nietzsche's uh, the camel, the... The lion, right. the child. The well, the guy, the guy that disrespects well, the, the whole thing. The guy that disrespects the wise, the crazy old man in the in that like trope is always getting his ass kicked in thirty seconds. Like, <laughs> like, like monkey and, and journey to the west. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's always yeah. The, the only people that don't respect that guy seem to be like you know cruising for a bruising. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, whereas in the in the west, it's entirely opposite. Like we yeah. we're like that. You know that. This, yeah. Well, Merlin was kind of like that. For, well, for, that was the closest that the Christian West got to having a wise old man. Yeah, so thing. that's the and, and Faust maybe kind of. Also, the SJW Faust was the, 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 the yeah no yeah. He was so in the West. Right, right, what what? So, so, that, so the SJW phenomenon in the West, I think that's because there's no goofy wise old men here. Like you don't really view the elder like that. Well, that's yeah. why I like Zelda because it kind of Zelda recaptures that for the West. It's got the whole Merlin yeah. tradition and the yeah, Knights of the Table and that whole. There was a time when Christianity had that that mythological landscape to it, and then it doesn't anymore. Even Thompson was into this whole. He had this idea, this this 
what Christianity, this Christian Irish Christianity, that could have happened if, or no, what, what was it that with the Vikings didn't? Um, yeah, Irish Christianity. They, exactly they right. didn't invade a certain yeah. place that there would have been a different. Lindisfarne. Oh, that's yeah. what Lindisfarne yeah. was. Yeah, I mean that was, yeah. and that's why it was such a mind fuck. Uh, calling back to episodes forty two and forty three, where <laughs> I interviewed Bill Thompson about his Lindisfarne retrospective. Um, that was the thing that so that always confused me about his decision to name this this planetary think tank group, uh, this renaissance of planetary culture, Lindisfarne, because it was totally self defeating. The idea the idea that you're gonna like rhyme a history by saying here is our like last bastion of visionary mystics yeah, the holding Irish out fight in him, though, yeah right? holding out against was, this was, this was, sort of the, the, you know yeah. the collapse of civilization <laughs> it's like he he started on false premises like and he complains that this is why you know he he, he like bitches about you, Buckminster. you're mowing Thompson down? I like, love William Am Thompson. I hearing this I right? I love him. Yeah. <laughs> but this is my one critique, is that he bitches about You called me out when I was doing it. You were like, fuck you, oh, man. Listen, I'm listen, listen. to put your Wikipedia page back up. Forget that. <laughs> you're, if you're dissing Thompson. <laughs> listen, I love him. I am. We all I love him. Respect him. We all love everybody. We all but, love everybody. But I think that he made a mistake in framing it as defeat, even if he's right, and yeah, the, fuck, the yeah. fucking thing is, the older I get, the writer he is. Yeah, I know. you know, the That's, more obvious it yeah. is that we are in a collapse phase. You know, That's but Spangler. But but at the same time, I I, I turned Thompson on to Spangler, on. by the way. Yeah, but you have to. That's <laughs> me. Like that. You have to be uh, the optimist all the time. Well, but exactly, and we'll transform it. That's like, exactly. You know. That's it. Is that is that to the degree that you just sort of accept it, you're not going to win. To the degree that you're like, aha, but we can be canny about this. And, you know, his thing was, um, that, you know, he, he bitched about Buckminster Fuller being yes. a media whore, basically. Yes, I that, remember that. That he was just like, Buckminster Fuller was just, he would run downstairs to see if his name was in the newspaper that morning. And it's like, so what? It's like, it's like, yeah, but you know what he did? I would too. <laughs> you know what he did? Is that, and you're like, on the other hand. Is that, you know, he, he was a far more effective uh, virus for these ideas than, than Bill because, and, you know, because one, yeah, yeah, because he chose to frame it in terms of, you know, don't fight the system, build a better mousetrap, we can do this, there is a way, it, you know, the resources are dependent on our ability to uh, imagine or perceive them, yeah. you know, and that's actually a much more useful message. Yeah, and that, like, sounds, yeah, like, useful. that sounds Peter Thiel, because Peter Thiel always talks about this definite positive view if you want to create a better future. Yeah, except Peter Thiel is like the opponent, you know, in oh, this, what? I mean, in the sense that like Jeff Bezos and all of these guys, you know, they're, they're, they're the bad guy. Well, they're, well, not the bad guy, but there's a sense in which there's a sense in which uh, that kind of optimism can be taken too far. I feel like Buckminster Fuller was clearly and obviously still motivated by compassion mm -hmm. in this, rather than just sort of like sort of uh, dismissing or dodging the conversation about the fact that yes, yeah, superabundance is going to solve all of this mm -hmm. someday. But like, I mean, uh, to be fair, like. You know, they're, they're, the the whole singularity university thing of like let's help a billion people right now. You know, that's very nobly motivated. But uh, there's something about the way that techno optimism yeah, is being discussed right, now, and right. Peter Thiel is absolutely participating in that conversation. That well, sounds the superabundance thing. It sounds a lot to me. Um, Peter Diamandis. You know, that's yeah, to, yeah. you know, but that yeah. that whole thing like it sounds a lot to me. Like the kind of shit that I hear at hippie music festivals, right. where so they're like, yeah. they're like, you just have to come from a place of abundance. And I'm like, oh, you yeah, mean, that, you okay. mean, so, so Teal is a trust kind of opposite. That's that's the Teal, okay, so maybe so, I'm getting this wrong. So, so Teal, he basically, his perspective is entirely Girardian. His main influence is Rene Girard, which is why I started to study Girard pretty deeply okay. in the past two years. So he has this model that's more based on mimetic desire. And the sacrifice of the founder of the, as the scapegoat. So, so, am I completely wrong about Teal in terms of his? Um, like... Yeah, I would say he he's you know he's definitely talking to people in that crowd, but usually he's the one who's saying, "No, you're wrong. I'm right." And it, like the way he communicates is very interesting because he always kind of has the same message every single uh, interview he he goes into like it. It's actually very rare for him to share anything new in different interviews. Hmm. But 
he basically basically just paints this uh, picture of uh, we gotta solve mimetic conflicts type of picture, and then um, just the issue of like most of our consumption is due to the fact that we want things that we've been taught to want, and that that's that's what's killing you know that's what's causing all this trouble. Is that um, mimetic, right? That idea. Yeah, I don't know if he talks so much from that direction as much as like this the uh, the founder needs to be like a extreme insider and extreme outsider. That's why. That's how you get someone who's crazy enough to create the better future. Mm. So he's like a good leadership. Like, if you want to be in a leadership role, he's someone to look up to and figure out. Is that is that what you mean? Like, well, I would say no. He's more of a decision maker. He's someone who's able to identify valuable people before other people are. That's the that's role cool. he plays, and that's what I try to understand out of him. Mm. And you were saying that Peter Thiel, he has an idea about... But then, like, the other funny thing is, like, I I compare him to uh, L. Bob Reif when I talk to uh, Neil Stevenson. Okay, so now, okay, you got to go there with us, please. Okay, L. Bob Reif of Snow Crash and, you know, Peter... T you mean because of the seasteading thing, or...? Um, more than just that. <laughs> it's like, really, he's got the seasteading and he's, like, this, uh... The rich person who's into like the nature of mythology, like Peter Thiel's top recommended book was called um, "Things Hidden Since the Foundation Gerard. of the World." Yeah, nice. it's Gerard. He, so yeah. he he reads. Uh, yeah, love? yeah. So that's his know that. top so recommended book. Probably completely wrong about him, according to IQ. So, so, so that's <laughs> his top <laughs> recommended book. Know. And and you see, Al Bob Reif, he was also trying to find this code that's hidden since the uh, begin the beginning of the world and yeah what is it called foundation of the world that was the yeah example. Exactly. I said the beginning. foundation of the world Whatever. Great. yeah so anyway yeah. and this it code is. it's it's uh, John 1-1 one, one. hey John <laughs> so in the beginning there was the word word and the word was with God and the word was God right so that's the code underlying the universe in snow crash and that's also what Peter Thiel is trying to break when he's trying to create innovation through venture capital. I like the comparison of the, uh, the logos with, with Stevenson mm -hmm. like that. The, you compared it to, uh, to John. So what did Stevenson say to that? Um, so he didn't really know the reference to Teal. He's like, okay, I guess Teal's some random rich guy, cool. <laughs> huh. He has to know who Teal That's strange, yeah. I mean, he's, I mean he, he at least presents and seems from his work to be like one of the most well-read dudes in the world. Yeah, I mean, the thing is like... Have you read Thomas Pynchon? So, I, I guess <laughs> yeah. I'm not too surprised. Yeah, that, that's, I'm not too surprised he's because... He's like the next uh, level up from Stevenson. Like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Because Teal, when he wrote Zero to One, the mythological things weren't really that explicit. But if you look at his online lecture notes, when he, talk, he taught that class at Stanford, you would see like this huge section on the founder as victim and the founder as God. So... I don't know hmm. how many times I've read that little article over and over again. Probably like at least two dozen times. So, oh, That's oh, very okay. So, yeah. so bringing it back to clowns, yeah. you're saying that this is where the, this is yeah. where Trump yeah. comes in, right? Yeah. Because and the CEO, not just clowns, the CEO like anyone, is the clown that is like sacrificed, the Christ like, sort of like, but eaten by the yeah, company. Like anyone who's a true innovator, you're you're at both. You are both extremes. You you got the you're the extreme outsider and the extreme insider. So so clowns are like extreme. You got the extreme scary part and also the extremely funny part. So you got the two poles that so, you contrast against. So that's so the <laughs> the extreme insider and the extreme outsider mm -hmm. is inside and outside of you at the same time, and that's the answer to the question, is, it, is, the, in, is the entity inside or outside of you? Yeah. you know? Which means that, that Trump is inside all and of this, us. And this why, yeah, exactly. So I'm not sure that conclusion that. follows from your premise. And, and you this, just don't want it to follow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. 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 yeah, so this is exactly what I wrote about in something unpublished. Uh, and it also kind of reflects back to why the same Taleb believes in God, because it's a fat tail distribution right there. You have, on one extreme, you have the extreme outsiders, on one extreme, you have the extreme insiders. And when you do your investment strategy, that's what you do. You, you invest in the very stable extreme insiders, but then you also invest in the very 
volatile extreme outsiders to try to capture all the positive uh, black swan benefits. Well, you just blew my mind because yeah. <laughs> because mm -hmm. I've my main metaphor for uh, investment mm -hmm. has been this the, it came out of this paper, this research paper I read talking about how they managed to computationally confirm the the sort of uh, the the general strategy that that people will take a dartboard approach, the monkey throwing at a dartboard, mm -hmm. and that. You know, if you everyone wants to hit the center of the dartboard, but actually the the small low cap mm -hmm. companies are the ones that grow really fast. And so, if you can find them earlier, they're the better early investments. Yep. And but the anyway, the point is that the so they're saying that basically randomness mm -hmm. is better investment than like trying to select for what you think are the um, best portfolios. And the point is that the the, the fucking dartboard is a harlequin. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, shit. Yeah, and, yes. Uh, right. So basically, I want to elaborate more on Todd yeah. on this point. That uh, so he actually has in one of the articles That's he wrote true, online, yeah. he has this thing about throwing things at the dartboard. And what he says is that people, most people, want to aim for the center, right? So you want to have uh, accuracy and precision. Okay. So accuracy is like, are you close to the center or not? Well, precision is like, out of everything you throw, are they clustered? close together or not. Mm -hmm. So what he says is that actually most people think if you want to not fall off the board completely, you would want to aim for the center for accuracy, right? But he says, no, that's not the case. You actually want precision. So even if you're not directly centered, like if you're a bit off centered, that's your cluster, at least you're not going off the edge. So you're not uh, risking death. Hmm. So how That's can we cool. tie that back into Legend of Zelda? Yeah, you know, just, I mean, there's lots of. Well, Michael will do it. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me. Yeah, it's just, it's all a cast. It's the whole landscape that we're describing is mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing in my mind, you know. But I mean, there are lots of clowns in Zelda, right, in one way or another. But I mean, it, there are. Actually, there was one thing that I actually was just thinking about was I had this. There's something that I was working on this writing thing that was. That I was doing last year, and I was talking about uh, like how the state is an alchemical lab laboratory, and and for some reason we worked out Donald Trump as an alchemical homunculus. <laughs> <As a homunculus. laughs> yeah, for some reason, we worked him out of our you know the clash of all of you know our psyches together worked out this this figure, and we have to understand we have to understand why. Yeah, know? we've thrown him up just like the Germans threw Hitler up. Right. Yeah. That for, for them, Hitler just made total sense. He's going to pull us out of the Depression. He's well, going to put everyone that to work. Sense you know? either, but yeah, I'm just saying that, for, you know, I don't, I don't make all these projections, but... There's an unconscious reason. Yeah, right. And here's another interesting thing, is that there's a lot of alchemical symbolism in Trump, right? He's golden. Yeah. Right? He's got right. these weird alchemical signifiers. Right. And it makes me think about, you know, the alchemists were always, they were spiritual so they always insisted that their gold was not the vulgar gold right, right. they had the term like the non vulgi you know yep. but trump reminds me of the vulgar gold like the exoteric alchemist mm -hmm. that was trying to create fool's gold or they actually thought that you could I make like that. Well, yeah, so, yeah. so what about Trump, <laughs> I like Trump's that. incantations like when he calls people names lying ted crooked hillary so what are those that's just like that, that's things? like if you had a, a a crude version of the philosopher's stone mm -hmm. it could be something that could just I don't know. That's yeah. NLP. That's fucked up. That would that's be NLP. NLP. <laughs> instead of NLP. Yeah. NLP. Oh, that's a good, yeah, that's a good way to... to yeah, because right. he knows that on Twitter, he can if he starts some calling Hillary Clinton crooked Hillary, then he's like fixing that into yeah, the and that's the public. that's the message. Yeah. That it's in there. So it's like, he, it's he's just like waving his, his dick around, really. I'm, yeah. I'm just, I don't know, man. That's weird. I mean, I realize that these some of these alchemical ideas can be deconstructed back to some weird racial ideas about like colors and like how like we take colors in a certain way like Trump's golden hair is like gold like it, did that have a, did that have a resonance with people at some level right yeah. it's fucking weird man yeah. it's like he yeah. looks like that he looks golden like a <laughs> right. right. and right. that's you know we worked out but you know like the, but the, the alchemists it was all the gold was not really gold though it was all it was, there was one alchemist that said it was invisible gold you know like there's actually an incredible the UFO case. Right. It all goes <laughs> nice track. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, but to the, the cloud wants. No, the cloud wants. There to are clouds. There's digital digital cash. It's Bitcoin. You're the best right. gold. It's, um, <laughs> the Orium. Uh, anyway, but invisible gold. Right. 
forgot where I was going with this, but and, you know, anyway. interestingly, in, in, in John C. Wright's yeah. uh, his his six part thing, and you know, he'd be an interesting. I don't know if any of you have read John C. Wright. He's I feel like he's he's a he's a principal author in this conversation. A very a, what has he written? He wrote um, the a trilogy, the Golden Ecumen, and then another six book series called the uh, Account to the Eschaton. Like, but it's so or no the, yeah. eschaton, the eschaton sequence. It starts with Count to a Trillion. Oh, that sounds cool. The last book is Count to Infinity. The eschaton yeah. sequence. But it's um, the, I like words that you know, I, I like fantasy. finding words that just feel good in my brain. You know, and that's one of them. The eschaton sequence. That's, you know, <laughs> like I, those words yeah, are like so. So it's not stuck like, in there now. You like Michael's poetry? Yeah, exactly. Because he can do that. It's a, yeah, he's a, a he's an attorney. <laughs> who wrote the, the most psychedelic science fiction trilogy, Golden Ecumen, yeah, go ahead. Uh, while he was still a flaming atheist, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then decided in his ultra ra- and like like high profile skeptic, right? You know, made that a big part of his brand as a science fiction uh-huh. author. Mm-hmm. Then he said, "All right, well, the rational thing to do would be to accept the fact that if God is a transcendent entity." then God can disclose its identity at will or hide its identity from me at will as a lesser intelligence. So the only way I'm ever going to find out if he's like, so the theologians are right. He's like, God is revealed by revelation and not by like, you know, analysis. And so he's like, all right, God, show yourself to me. And then, like, the next day or the day after, he has a heart attack that puts him in the hospital. Oh, wow. And while he's in the hospital, he's visited by three spirits, including the Mother Mary, and it decides at the age of 40, or, like, in his 40s, mm-hmm. to become a born-again Catholic. When will that happen to Sam Harris? <laughs> <laughs> Sam Harris is not logical enough to ask... Let's kick Ooh. Sam Harris around. So Sam Harris is not rational enough to ask God if he exists. <laughs> no. To like wave his fist at the sky because that would be silly. I of course, you know it's what? It's not rational. Yeah, it's not rational to do that. When I think John C. Wright figured it out. The actual rational thing to do mm-hmm. is to say, okay, transcendent intelligence, I would like to see you now. You know, and then if it doesn't happen, then try again later. Oh no, it'll happen. <laughs> Trust me on that. It'll show up in some weird accident or Something that you didn't see coming. <laughs> so J.F. Martel it? and Phil Ford talk about that. I think you would love uh-huh. Weird Studies podcasts. Uh-huh. They yeah. they talk about that with um, doing this is J.F. Martel. Ma- yeah, yeah, okay. Doing magical works, and he said like seems really cool. I, I haven't interacted yet or heard your. Oh he yeah, said, it seems like a really nice guy. He said that he said that it ma- basically he tried magic just to see, uh-huh. you know, just for shits basically. Like right. he said, this story is so nuts. He said he asked for a large sum of money. In his magical ritual, and then he got like it probably a, showed up. Right? Well, he got like a refund to the like for like ten bucks or something. But the check in the memo line said the sum in like really unusually bizarrely large <laughs> lettering. Mm-hmm. You know, that took up like a huge, and he kept it because it was a large sum <laughs> of money. <laughs> he, was like, he was like, "This shit is too weird. I'm out." Like. <laughs> Oh man, that was great. That was really good. He's like, you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful when you're doing this shit. That's that's a clown playing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. (laughs) Exactly. That was awesome. The setup was great. The punchline was great. It was like, dude, you should be like a stand-up comedian, Mm -hmm. a comedian of ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when uh, Baudrillard died, and somebody reviewed him as a comedian of ideas to try to delegitimize him. I'm like, mm-hmm. at that point, well, that's actually what I want to be, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> but so now like, I kind of like the yeah, idea. Yeah, like, what if I'm like Duncan Trussell or Joe Rogan, but mm-hmm. I just interview ideas, but rather than people, and that's kind of what you do for your day. Yeah, I so take I, comedy seriously. Yeah, you're a dead philosopher project. You're interviewing the ideas. I, <laughs> How could you not laugh at that joke? Yeah, that so you, you are the I com- take comedy the, seriously. Wait, are you, are, you, are you talking about how... You're the comedian of Through the medium that you've yeah. been interviewing, like Rudolf Steiner. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Talk more about that, because that's oh, the, fascinating. Uh, I mean, yeah, okay. speaking, of, speaking of respect to the crazy old man, like, yeah. I've never... I, <laughs> I told, I told Notice my... Notice that now I am yeah, yeah, like you're, crazy. You're, no, 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 no,
the actual statement was, speaking of crazy, old, respect to crazy old men, um, when I told my friend that I've never seen... Hey, I'm you. only 49. Come on. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> You're assuming. I said, I said, I've never seen you pay more respect to anyone than the ghost of Rudolf Steiner. That's why I love, I love Steiner. Steiner. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the dude. so it was. It was. Oh, he's he's the he was so good. Yeah. You know, it was funny because when I when I studied Steiner, I was living in San Francisco, and I was managing a bookstore, and I was just reading Steiner, and I decided it was so good. It, you know, it took a moment to like figure out how to get into him because like Robert McDermott's uh, Essential Steiner was terrible. You know, it's a, it's a bad book, and I was like, this is not working. I don't see why. Why is Thompson like this? But then I started reading the lecture cycles, and once I got into those, I became like a Steiner addict. And that was all I read literally for one entire year. Steiner, 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 for the whole year. And uh, I, I, I was an addict. Hey. But, yeah, yeah, that's right. One of his blackboard drawings. Yeah, I came home. On the cover of Michael <laughs> Kamen's book, Absence. Hey, go on. No, that was my point. It was just... So, so you, yeah, so yeah, I watched this. So you, it's like a drug, he, and he is like a drug. When you're reading him, um, it's kind of like listening to like Terrence McKenna. Yeah, he's into that world. Yeah, yeah, he just has a talent for. It's really like smooth and effortless, and it trances like, you. Into oh, I can see how you know? Saturn might be this being, and Mars is this other being. And it's, the guy was such a master. Yeah, yeah, he was the best. He's probably my one of my all-time favorite. He's definitely my favorite mystic of all time. So do you favorite mystic? So the thing that I couldn't wrap my head around though is that like the way that you managed in that conversation to completely bracket everything and just take it at total face value, you know, like that you kind of put off the empirical concern, yeah. and you didn't get into like, you know, oh, so Ru Rudolf Steiner channeled through my my media. Who is who's your friend again? The media? Oh, Shorty Campbell. Shorty. Yeah. Campbell. Okay. Yeah. So I should tell the story that. Yeah. Um, after my mother died, she died last year, I had been flirting with the idea for a long time of contacting a medium. I just wasn't sure who, which medium to contact or anything like that. So I discovered Bob Olson's website, his YouTube channel, where the guy was um, a former private detective, uh, an atheist, and then his dad died. He was like, I wonder if there's like some way that I could contact him. And he did indeed, after experimenting with different mediums, he did indeed find a medium that could contact his father, and he held this conversation with him. He was like, this shit works. It's real. It's actual. Um, so then he created this website where he has uh, all the mediums on that website are all reputable because he's, he, he's right. checked them all, and, and it's totally reputable. So I found a medium on there. So there's a directory. Of yeah, yeah, it's mediums. called uh, like something like a best psychic mediums, I think. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's generic. The guy's yeah. a private detective. Let's cut him some slack. <laughs> but there's, but there's, no, apparently they have some uh, like a process of accreditation. Right. So yeah, it's, well, it's Amazon reviews. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, a lot of them are tested by Bob himself. Okay. And if he tests one of these mediums, he puts like a gold star. On there. So these are the ones he's. Tested, okay. but the other ones are ones that he's heard good things about. That you can go to these people and get results. You know, they're not charlatans. So he convinced me. I don't know. I watched enough of his videos that, that he convinced me. So then, uh, after my mother died, I, I uh, my brother and I found a medium that could channel her, and it was I was 100% convinced it was her. I it, she knew all these things. You know, the, the medium could not possibly have known. And so once we did that and it was successful, I started thinking, I wonder if it would be like possible to interview Oswald Spengler, because he's like my all-time favorite. And I was like, is there some way that we could like dial him up? So I asked uh, the medium and she was like, I can't do that shit. I was like, what, why? She was like, no, this first medium who channeled my mother. Um, and she was like, I can't go and get a celebrity unless I have some at some point, some physical connection with that celebrity. Um, so she, couldn't, she couldn't, didn't have that ability. So I put it out there um, that uh, I went to the website of Eliza Meadows, you know, and I went to her website and I asked her, I said, would you like to be willing to like channel Joseph Campbell, have, have your son, you know, because her son committed suicide and died. He went to the other side, he contacted her. She was also an atheist. Uh, which was why it was so difficult for him to contact her. Uh, 
because he was appearing to the other relatives first in their dreams and stuff. Ooh, and and one time he just shows up in the living room of her brother, and her brother calls her, and he's like, you know, I, I, your son is contacting me. I think you should like consider the possibility that maybe there is an afterlife, and this, and he's trying, he's on the other side trying to get you. Mm-hmm. And then so one night she was sleeping, and then she saw him sitting at the on the edge of her bed, and he was like jumping back and forth. He's like, you can see me, <laughs> mom, you can see me, and she was like, she was like, oh my god, you know. So it was this huge experience for her. Um, so then. Eric has this interesting ability where he can go get any celebrity that you want. And so I went to their website and I was watching them interview what browser? Jesus Christ, Adolf Hitler, Howard Hughes. They just did a really interesting one with Stephen Hawking. That was cool. Because you know uh, that Hawk, what Hawking said in that interview? It, 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 let's assume it is Hawking. Interview. Right. You know, it's a little, it's a little crazy. This is what I mean by the bracket. <laughs> that you're really yeah. good at just taking the shit at face value. Yeah. It, but I always brag it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I, so Hawking said what? He goes, um, in a past life, I was a Roman emperor. <laughs> he goes, I, yeah, I was an emperor, and I got everything I wanted. And I was really mean to people. And I told people, you know, I, he was apparently one of the cruel Roman emperors. Mm. And he's like, that's why I reincarnated this time as this person who can't do any harm to anyone. He was you neural. Know, his Holy whole body neutralized, mm-hmm. because yeah. now he's in a, the exact opposite position where the, the Roman Emperor could hurt anyone he wanted, but in this incarnation with ALS, he couldn't hurt anyone. And all, so all that was left to him was his mind. He's like, that's why I did it, because I had access to my mind in a way that probably wouldn't have been possible if I'd had a, control over my body. And uh, I just loved it. I, I thought it was a wow. great interview. I was convinced it was him. Wow, um, that's, that reminds me of Count of Monte Cristo, mm-hmm. where in, when... The main character asked uh, the Abbe Freya, he said, uh, well, if I was out of this jail, maybe I couldn't have figured out all this stuff, essentially. Mm-hmm. That, that theme of confinement mm-hmm. runs throughout everything, including the myth of Merlin, yes. you know, and, and yes, Arthur, this whole thing about you know, being thrown in jail, etc. Um, it's, it's missing from the Christic, like the mainstream Christic narrative because all of his teenage years are missing. Yeah. And yeah. so you don't, yeah. you don't see him go into the fucking tree. I know. What did he do during those years? He went to India. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, he, maybe, yeah, maybe. Talk that's, yeah. that's like, I mean, at least I don't know that for, I don't know that well enough to shout it like I just did, mm-hmm. frankly, but like, it's cool to think of though. But like it is, I mean, all signs point to yes, if there was any kind of historical figure at all. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. then yeah, I agree. There, do, there does seem to be enough cultural interchange right. between those two regions that the story itself mm-hmm. traveled back and forth yep. enough yep. that it became a part of the story at the very minimum. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, like, okay, so this is this is uh, the probably the most like personal thing I've ever said on this show, and it's just been like so like this is the conversation for it, because um, I, I love you, listeners, and. I don't know, a lot of you I don't know, but uh, at this point, if you're listening this far, then you really care. So here we go. Um, 11 years ago, uh, or so, 12 years ago, I had a series of mushroom trips outside Lawrence, Kansas at Clinton Lake, where my friends and I would go hiking in the woods and like go down to the water and like hang out by the water, and hang, you know. And I'd, I'd been doing that for four years at that point, you know, a couple times a year. And... Then, you know, like the spring, you're like, yeah, you do a spring trip and a fall trip or whatever. Enough to have seen some really weird shit and have been able to, like, what I call stay on my perch. Like, to be able to remain rational in the face of utter hallucinogenic nonsense. So Robert Hansen Wilson could do. Yeah. He was a cowboy too. That, that this, <laughs> that, you, that like, like, I remember one time in particular that uh, my friends and I, and I uh, a couple years before, had gotten ourselves into this spot that was like all spiky trees, like acacia trees, and spider webs. And we were tripping so hard that all we could see were like hexacons everywhere. My friends and I were like, how do we get out of this little like glen here? And I was like, wait a minute, uh, follow the hexagons. Because the angle mm-hmm. of the thorn to the branch and all of the, the spider web stuff mm-hmm. is octagonal. 
Like that's the yeah. I was right. like, it's yeah. a forty-five yeah. instead of a sixty-degree oh. angle. You just got to follow the sixty-degree so angle. So you got these thread. Well, yeah, for you to get out of it. So, so yeah, so we followed the hexagons and got out. So, like, I'm not a total dipshit. Like, okay, when I tell this story, and I tell that story in order to tell this next story, which is about how in I, I was like fairly fucking scientific, and yet by that point, and in this place that I was very familiar with and comfortable with, and right, because you you came out of paleontology, right? Yeah. Your background was in hardcore science. Well, I mean, you know, dealing with yeah. concrete. Although I think, although to be fair, I don't think lab and experimental science was ever like my strength, and I think you know a lot of this was more about the mystical experience of like uh, uh, looking, you know, prospecting for fossils out in the, the badlands, you know, right. like that. What it does to to really be inhabiting a landscape of that age and to be like immersed in that kind of a sense of depth. And then to have, to be like to revelation to find things, which again going back to Bakker is I think the point is that he's like a, de- a desert revelatory mystic, yep. you know that like he never really like made that. sense he I never like really that. made sense <laughs> in the institution, yeah. you know and he's over his life he's bounced around from school to school and museum to museum, and you know for a while didn't even have a museum of his own he just had a society that's like when no. I was working with him. Huh. Um, so but, he wasn't a, uh, a celebrity at that point. No, he was. Oh, he, he already he was. was, but he just wasn't affiliated anymore okay. with the uh, University of Colorado. Gotcha. Um, but at any rate, the the point was that in 2007, I had four mushroom trips. The four I had that year, that um, I saw this shit. Just you know, you, this whole time, this conversation, there's been this paused YouTube video, Terrence McKenna, yeah. the definitive UFO tape, <laughs> which, which shows both saucers and cigar what shapes. What are the odds? And cigar shaped <laughs> UFOs and a, uh, a number of cross, like, flying, glowing <laughs> crucifixes. Uh, this is my contribution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah, Michael was entertaining. I was us. trying to do tarot, tarot reading. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, we're having a great time. He was like, check out this McKenna video. Hilariously, the uh, YouTube search bar says, Deus ex McKenna. Actually, it says Deus, but anyway. I thought you were going to read like one of my porn files. I was like, oh shit, now I've got to cover this up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here are our Negredo at Agur. We're, we're <laughs> mixing it all again. <laughs> but yeah, four, but yeah. it's narrative collapse. The um, <laughs> the point is the the you can tell I watch here, com- I watch comedy, you know. It's <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, this year I saw four uh, basically like UFO sightings, but I would wait. Are you serious? Yeah, I couldn't you call them UFOs. Yeah, you can't just <laughs> drop them. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's typically how I you start the story. Prepare us for this. No, 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 no. Okay. You saw okay. four okay. UFOs. Well, let us finish the story. All four I want to see a UFO. All, I've never all seen four it. of these these yeah. trips took place over the year. 2006 to 2007. Right. They all happened at the water, uh, like at the lake uh-huh. in Lawrence, Kansas, uh-huh. uh, at Clinton Lake, which I, I later, I found out after the first one, actually does have some kind of rumors of UFO activity, although it's not well documented. And some other people had seen some stuff out there in the years prior. Right. And the, But these things were not like... What I they're not what I what I had ordinarily heard of described as UFOs. They were uh, like clear, luminous objects. Like they're, they're transparent disturbances in space with like certain colored lights at certain parts of them. And so they look and more than anything like like the predator crossed with like a bioluminescent fish right, flying right. around in the sky. Right. Okay. Well, I love that. So there's an early ufologist that thought UFOs were organic beings that we don't understand. Yeah, and they are kind of bioluminescent, aren't they? That is what they are. And so some of them, some of them, like the first, the first night I had just started watching, the night before I had just seen the two-hour press conference uh, video of the disclosure, the disclosure project, which is uh, you know John. Stephen Greer's yeah. whole thing, where he's trying, he's got this like armada of former military scientists and I was talking about the disclosure project. Yeah, yeah, nuclear technicians, all these these folks who uh, you know had top secret clearance, and we sort of tacitly trust on a day to day basis with our lives, coming forward and saying I was directly involved in the cover up. We actually live in a huge ecosystem of intelligences. You know, we have all these different relationships to them. And then the next day, my friends and I went tripping at the lake, and suddenly, 
this fucking thing, you know, and it's like I was primed to see it. I fully, completely accept that I was primed to see it. Why well, had you? Really, because of because you weren't of the, sober. No, I, I was. I was on mushrooms. But the point oh, was. I'm that, sorry. Like, you were primed to see it. I mean, that's. Good. I was gotcha. primed to see it that's in like the trans experience. Right. The, I was primed yeah. to see it by having watched the Disclosure right. Conference. Right. Okay. The night before. But that doesn't mean it wasn't real, too. In right. Some way. Also, you know what I mean? And in yeah. fact, it happened right after I said, because um, I was sitting with my girlfriend down at the water. And there was this, my, we were there on a double date with my friend and his girlfriend, and he was an aerospace engineering student and, who had built all of his own reprodu reproductions of Jimi Hendrix's pedals. Like he was this brilliant electrical engineer. Did, did he make that? Oh, I probably just incriminated you. That in purple pedal? 11 years but, ago. But he sold them at, like, that there was that one Jimi Hendrix Watt pedal that you could but, get. But not that, that, not oh, that. Okay. But like he made I his thought own. all computer geeks were in the second time. Right. But <laughs> at, any rate, the, at any rate, the. Um, the point was, we were sitting there, down there by the water, at the at the bottom at the, of this, I mean, on this jetty that had this, uh, it, we were like opposite the dam on this reservoir, and there was like a plug in this jetty uh, that went, you could tell it like led to like a sewer system or something that was under the water, because you could hear things down there, even though right. the water level was here. And I, at one time, I, another night, a different year, uh, I had heard something even walking around down there, and it creeped the shit wow. out of us. <laughs> uh, so we, this, pl this place we knew was kind of weird, we got off here, and there was a building there in this field. It was a meadow at the end of a like a service uh, access road, yeah. and there was a there's a building there that uh, had like a power co cable coming out of the building, but then ending where just like without going anywhere. And my buddy, who's this engineer, was like, "That makes no sense at all." And then so he and I both came up with this thing that it, the lake was actually being used to dampen some sort of electric. We were just bullshitting ourselves, you know. We were like, "Oh, it's being used to like." You guys were tripping at the yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. We're like, "Oh, the lake must be used to uh, to like mediate some sort of uh, wireless transfer of electricity into orbit to be picked up by one of these experimental beam powered." <laughs> Propulsionless VTOL These plasma of, beings. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, well, and then, and then, like, and then right as I was like, yeah, in fact, if you trace from the lake to this plug and then up the hill the road to this building and then to the, co the power cord that goes nowhere, then there should be a spaceship right there. And then, like, <laughs> you deduced it. One minute later, we're walking up the hill and exactly where I had pointed, this thing flies over the ridge. Oh, man. And. That's called evocation. I know, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and I ran after it. That I, actually, I do tell this. I told a part of this story when I was on Eric Davis' show. Oh. Um, the two, I have a 2011 episode Technosis. of Expanding Minds. Yeah. Where I, I talk Eric about Davis. how I love when, this, book, when this UFO appeared to me the first time, I thought it was out there in a simple way. And I ran after it to try and get a better look. And it flew behind a tree, but then I could see it in front of the tree, like it wasn't behind the tree. It's a goosebumps, dude. And I knew that it was in that that I was it, you but that I was, them. but that I was, I was missing the point. That I was like being like sort of tested. That's in what a, McKenna in a, and Valet would say that they're testing your consciousness. They're like, they're like Zen koans. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, yeah, and and it, it was koans. basically it was basically can, koan. it was like, yeah. can you figure this That's out? Cool. Yeah, I'm gonna steal that visual okay. koan. So, so like UFOs are visual. Yeah, yeah. UFO experience. That's so, great. Yeah. So, just so what for what this is worth, Sufjan <laughs> Stevens knows this. While we're talking about UFOs and right crosses, sweet that Sufjan <laughs> Stevens knows this because he has the song uh, about the the uh, concerning the UFO sighting outside of blah 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 Illinois. It's, it's yeah. part of his yeah. his Chicago the album of Chicago like Illinois. Uh, and it's that was a whole bunch of clouds. Like, that that song, which by the way has Chicago, no co has no like consistent meter underneath it, and uh, Chicago. Flows. No, uh, the song concerning the UFO site. Oh, I'm sure. Okay. It has it has it's like on some weird eleven thirteen beat or something. Gotcha. So you never get settled into the beat. Right. And it's he says you know came the revenant, and he mm. recognizes the UFO as as a revenant. In this song, and it's like it just basically he basically says like the UFO is like this Christic appearance, you know, like a yeah. descent into you know it's an involution. Well, it's, it's, they're mythology machines. That's it's like the deepest are. song I've ever heard. For the record, <laughs> mythology yeah. machines. Well, no, what, whatever the yeah. UFO phenomenon occurs, it creates new myths. It creates new gods. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what it does. It's some mm -hmm. sort of machine that you know interjects a, that component into, into into a civilization. I mean, that's happening now. Yeah. Okay, so why, that's, why that's is part this, one. Why is this happening? <laughs> I mean, 
Dude, He's got his narrative. I showed them. No, Tucker Carlson is like this Fox News guy. You know, you know Fox News. Like who doesn't know Fox News, right? <laughs> I showed them. Never heard last of Last night, June eighth, mm-hmm. he just did a thing with me, and he interviewed Nick Pope from the UK Ministry of Defense. And he, this is the first one of the first times that a reporter in, in this age has taken the UFO subject seriously because they they've been there's been a policy of denial and ridicule about the UFO phenomena since the 1950s. And so we just watched this thing that ha- that aired last night uh, with Tucker Carlson interviewing uh, was Nick Pope, uh, yeah, the UK yeah, History of Defense, right. mm-hmm. talking about this UFO video they had. And he, this is a real phenomenon. These are objects. We don't know who's making them. They're they're technological crap that's beyond the capabilities that we have and that any other you know country has. And and it's and Tucker Carlson was like, well, what do you mean by that? Or how does that possible? Are they aliens? Like what? And he's like, well, you know, the governments don't want to speculate that far, but there's definitely objects that human beings aren't making that are flying around in our skies. And it's like, okay, well, we're going to cut to a commercial break now. I hope we have you on again. It's like, <laughs> great. And now for something that's like completely the most different. monumental idea of all time. But it's like, yeah. just, it's the end of an, it's an end of, a, of a new show. I mean, but that's the whole thing about like that's the whole thing about the UFO phenomenon. Yeah, I thought it, it was interesting. It can never be in the yeah. center of any kind of discourse. It, it it disintegrates centers because it's meant to be the imaginary of a of a, of a people. Like right. it's meant to be in the periphery. And as soon as you get it in the center, it will. Whatever our next it's mythology Mercurius. is, it's, it's going to involve extraterrestrials. This is what Jung and the alchemists I mean, would that's call be part Mercurius. Of the global planetary mythos that will eventually well, emerge. It's happening now. We were watching it. Yeah, you know, it's, also, it's also typical. It's the rule rather than the exception in human history. Yeah. Like, you yeah. know, the, the yeah. Lakota's star nations. Yeah. You know, that, that shit is uh, fairly par for the course among human beings. Right. And I think not the Western culture, culture though. No, Western culture, but, we but, have to have these beings into one form that can convince us that there's more beyond this. If those right. Were, they have beings all over the place. Right. They accept them. Next but it was, for us, it's but it, it, one of the best things that come out of the first podcast recording I did with you, John, was when you were talking about what comes next, and you were talking oh, yeah. you were talking about the the reemergence of a polar like a certain polar shamanic civilization. Yeah, and I think that that's that's really key because what does certain polar mean? Well, like the you know, like it used to be the you know, like Siberian shamanism, and like Northern Canadian, and that there right. were these you know that these these animals, the wolf, the reindeer, right, the, right, right. the grizzly, these are things that live all the re- all the way around. Oh, you know, and and now it's outer space. Well, no, now it's yeah. it, now the the we've the ice age ended, the land bridge receded, it's underwater. Mm-hmm. All the temp, the old temples. Yep. You know, pre uh, comet impact circa thirteen thousand years ago, offshore on the continental shelves or so you underwater. In the, in the comet impact? I do. I totally do. That was I, it, that was, I was the dinosaurs. You mean? No, 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 no. no, no. That's that's a whole separate thing. You're talking um, about later on. I'm talking about dinosaurs. there's there's the uh, you know um, Graham Hancock. Randall what does Carlson. Michael Garfield think of Graham Hancock? I you know he's a journalist. And he's a firebrand. <laughs> okay, and about those ideas, though, about these earlier civilizations. Well, so, and yeah. Sphinx so, being really old. But so, John Ebert doesn't think the Sphinx is... Uh, he doesn't agree with that no, research. No, no, well, I mean, whatever the case may be, yeah. we have all of these offshore temples that are under, like, 200, 300-foot column water. Okay? And I'm not, you know, like... Much like Graham Hancock claims to be, I'm actually not an expert in that shit. Mm-hmm. So... Um, you know, I, I, I cover it as best I can. But you can still form an opinion. Yeah, and my opinion, my opinion is that we had a a global um, seafaring civilization. Most of it was wiped out by the like a rapid glacial melt. Hmm. I think his his hypothesis that we uh, had like survivors that went around rebooting civilization. Uh, uh, right. Two, but not to not to this not as so Steiner much. Steiner talks. Well, not so much to the survivors. Uh, Vishnu and uh, not this not so much to the people that like lived in the cities and moved in, but interestingly to this, the people that had remained hunters and gatherers and were living further inland. Yeah. And were like being that this is the thing is that that we think agriculture like evolved at this specific time and we have this history of like human like really healthy human beings suddenly taking a hit. And like the life expectancy and the nutritional density that we observe in the skeletons and everything, it looks like agriculture really sucked for human beings for thousands of years. Mm. And I think it's because 
That's not us originally discovering agriculture in any kind of natural way. That's indigenous agriculture, which is basically like working in wild spaces, it's like wild crafting. Uh-huh. You know, the aboriginals and like of, of Australia, you know, they actually cultivated that land for for you know thirty thousand years or What's more. What's the word? Wild crafting. Wild crafting, where you're not you're not irrigating, um, but you might be like creating berms and things so as to create like natural irrigation. What about natural. love crafting? <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, exactly. That's nerd, where, that's, nerd joke. That's where you're only mentally aware of the hyper objects, but you're not actually able to instantiate it through your like comprehension of whole systems. But you were on praxis. something though before, um, before, in, before this whole interlude. And yeah. So at any rate, I think you know my my your my, uninformed, my uninformed opinion. Wait, is did that, you finish the cycle? No, I absolutely no. Right. I got part one of four. Oh. Okay. <laughs> that was only the first. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, but but like I don't want to I want to jump too too far. The, the, we can do this gracefully. So yeah, my my you know uneducated opinion is that I don't think that we need uh, aliens at any point in human history in order to explain anything. Yeah, but, I agree. I mean, but I, agree. I do yeah, think yeah. that there have been encounters between human beings and extraterrestrials through hyperspace. And, and that we, they, some of them have been made record. That's what the Hartox idea is that these shamanistic states, those hallucinations are actually beings. That yeah. Are so, I mean, in a sense, people. you can say you can't explain human history without aliens, but in another sense, what I'm saying is it's not like apes were going nowhere and then they were like bred with pigs and genetically modified by some like. You know, oh, like, I mean, that's all just like yeah. bollocks, mm. straight fucking nonsense. Stitchens, uh, yeah, and and I, yeah, the, like the you know William Genesis, Thompson's uh, direct attack on. on I read Sitchin. a few of his books. The funny thing about Stitchin was that uh, he was actually really erudite. Uh, uh, he was translating all these Sumerian texts himself, mm-hmm. so he taught himself the language. And there's not many people who. Can I wonder if Stevenson do that. That would have been a good question for Stevenson. Yeah. Does, does oh, he like no. Stitchin? What does he think of Stitchin? Fine. And he's really arrogant. Well, well, when you read him, him, you, know, you, you can't take it seriously. Him. Like you're saying that civilization was founded by extraterrestrials. I mean, no, you, you can't. And then he's seeing spaceships and some of the works of art. You know. But at the same time, but on the other hand, at you're, the same you're time, a lot of but cool at the same time, details. The fucking image absolutely can enter our consciousness without the thing appearing. And I do yeah. think yeah. I do oh, think fuck that, yeah, dude. Yeah, I, I do think that, that we can be yeah, drawn right. forward through history by the like this mm-hmm. hanging carrot. That's why I use the tarot, because these images are cross sections from all kinds of different times and places. All I mean, it's like the Hyperion contest. You know, Dan Simmons' is thing about this. There's like temples that travel backwards in time, and there's this whole thing of that's you know, the, 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 the Mobius yeah. strip. That's you know, the, the probe creating itself. Well, like, there's there's the book. Well, we're going there. Why not? I mean, we're, we're there, and we're almost there. Is there anywhere we're not going in we this conversation? We're going to have to do a video. We're going to have to do a, 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 do a Michael existence. Garfield's tarot. Existence. We're going to film that. We're going to do Michael Garfield's tarot. John Ebert is going to explain. You have four really smart the, people in a room. Right. I mean, what's going to happen? Well, Hugh is going to relate the tarot to finance. We're, like, and, creating and, uh, an intellectual John, black hole. It's not like with the tarot, we're just in just terms of the... A singularity event. So, we're actually... I think you know we are clearly within a singularity because because this does lead g- real gracefully into the into the act two, which is that um, if we're talking about there being a you know like again Timothy Morton does talks about there being no present and he's taking a really weird radical uh, perspective I think just to be contrarian um, but he he's you know he says it's only past and future because it's only the influence of these hyper objects and the, you know our consciousness is just the nexus of these inner objective causal relationships, right. and therefore, at the end of time. right, and therefore we're not really like, yeah, we're just a handshake, which is actually what I saw in my first DMT trip was that the president was was selected from an in, like a sexual relationship between one possible past and one so, possible future. So we're sexual, 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 or sexual, sexual, sexual. Okay. Well, yeah. in a sense that like there that's, were many possible oh, yeah, pasts right. and many possible futures, but that they yeah, were like so they were that's and, like, what, yeah, the other, uh, Well, that, yeah, that's yeah, a possible. transaction when you transfer from the data from one party to the other. When when you take these different possible universes as maybe nodes in like some sort of economic system. Therefore, I am Bitcoin. Yeah. You know. Yeah, in that sense. But so, but so there's this. Hmm. While we're in that theme, do so you have a lot of messages of Bitcoin? 
There's a Westmont bike. A lot of investments in Bitcoin. No, but I like I, I have invested a lot of conversation <laughs> in Bitcoin. You know, because I think it's fascinating. And and so this um, this thing about uh, everything creating everything else. You know, if you want to view it sort of as the photograph of negative of you know there being nothing except the intersection of you know forces that there is uh, this book called Who Built the Moon. Oh, I love that book, man. I got that from my brother for his birthday. So you've read it. And his, bro- his birthday is actually today, and I got that as a gift for him. No kidding. It's kind of words and crazy. Maybe not. Maybe that's not a synchronous statement. I'm just looking for meaning. Here. But, okay. No, you bought, yeah. you, you bought that? Who for... Built the Moon for my brother, yeah. Because he yeah. likes that kind of stuff, you know. And that's like birthday. That's a, yeah, today. Today is interesting. Really, yeah. Yeah. And he just had a really uh, uh, intense surgery. He, he had cancer in his knee. He had a tumor. Well, actually, it wasn't cancer. It was a tumor. And he, anyway, it doesn't matter. So, He's a great guy. So... What you read that book, yeah? I mean, uh, yeah, I, I guess I did. Yeah, I did. Read it, yeah. So, they, you can attest to the fact that they have all of this sort of. The moon is very mysterious. It looks like it was built. I mean, there's lots of aesthetic qualities to the moon that shouldn't exist if it was just captured by the gravitational field of the Earth. It looks like it was manufactured, and there's a, lot, a variety of reasons that the moon would be manufactured to make life possible on the Earth. So it's tricky, man. So I don't know. Maybe that's what this news is about Mars. There's life on, on Mars, and maybe we're going to discover that. Now I'm going way too far. Okay, interrupt well, me. So, so they, they, do, they give all this weird, compelling, uncanny shit. It's all about numbers and ratios. You know, as you said earlier, like you said, you said you, I don't know if that was a Freudian slip or not, but at the very beginning of this conversation, you were talking about the signal to noise ratio, and you said signal to noise Rachel. I and did. I was like, I was like thinking about <laughs> yeah, I was, caught it too, and I was like, what is signal Rachel? Because we were talking about narrative collapse. Yeah, Rachel, Rachel that. Rhymes. How is it? What does she have in common with them? I didn't kind of just yeah, make I gotta that. put that in. Well, it's because right. her eyes were green. I don't know. Oh, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I, she, I'm she, gonna, I'm she gonna had dig into it and find out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. So, so um, okay. at any rate, this this notion that the moon seems perfectly placed in order to facilitate it, the emergence of life and consciousness on this planet, and yes, right. also it's bizarrely perfectly proportioned relative to Earth, such that it's uncanny, dude. Such that the and this is like if you're into Westworld and you're like, wow, how, like if you saw like how. Uh, Robert Ford in that show sets up this elaborate mousetrap kind of a thing and it's just, you know, he's really playing every single character, human or, and host alike, and it's just this a grand operatic flourish. Then you get like a million times more out of this whole shit when you, when you consider that the moon generated the tidal forces that led to the mixing of elements in intertidal pools that led, uh, intertidal yeah, hot pools exactly that led right. Earth to yeah. life. And that it led to the tidal forces that led to organisms developing limbs with feet so that they could cling to rocks and tidal zones and emerge from the water and get on the land. Yep. And all of these moments, these, these sort of important moments in the history of life are regulated you know, by the moon and its relative distance to the earth at any given time. And it was closer back in the day, which I personally wonder whether that has to do with the fact that, you know, that other uh, creatures... That creatures could have been so large, you know. Like we talk about there being a, a like more the carboniferous. Oxygen. That's like more oxygen yeah. in the yeah. atmosphere. Happy, happy carboniferous. Yeah. But the, the records the, don't the scorpions actually... were like the size of dogs, and the the dragonflies were like and three these foot dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the tarot card, the moon. I love the carboniferous. It's, it's a big moon I, and a, a lobster yeah. coming out of the sea. I love it. It's, it's wild. Like, it's a, like, it's like evolution was just having a ball. It's like, yeah. how big can we make this dragonfly? Yeah. yeah, so that's, that's how they invented Pokemon. Right. So, dude, a lot of Pokemon are actually like Cambrian explosion, like what WTF, mate. So, and this is good because we're getting we're, we're dovetailing real neatly into part two here because the whole point was that they were basically saying that all of this conveniently wonderful Goldilocks history, and then we end up at a part where the yeah, it's my It dog. looks like Silver Surfer, though, doesn't it? The Magus. This mm-hmm. Magus card looks Colistar. like the Marvel character yes. Silver Surfer. Yeah, Hermes. I thought about that. Oh, but, and it is Hermes, but yeah. this is before Silver Surfer existed. But yeah, Silver Surfer is totally written by a. It is totally. Adept. Oh, an adept of Crowley? Uh, of uh, magic? magic of some kind, yeah. I forget. This yeah, kind of yeah cool. that's the magic. I think I've heard Alan Moore talk about that. I think the Silver Surfer was oh, my yeah, favorite right. comic book character of I mean, all time. We're talking again about the Chrome Praying Mantis back in the day. Right, yeah. He was the best. I just thought he was the coolest. Crowley has several magic. 
Magus, the only tarot deck that has like three magic, Magus, Magus cards or magic cards. Anyway. But so um, the the thing with the moon is that it ends up such that it is precisely one four hundredth the diameter of and one four hundredth the distance of the sun at exactly this moment in its decaying orbit, such that human beings on the surface of the planet, if present at all, would be like there to witness that perfect mm -hmm. eclipse. Mm -hmm. yeah. That at no point in the history of the planet has there ever been a total solar eclipse until the evolution of human consciousness. Right. And then it's going to it's going to separate just like it does in the background of Peter Gabriel's Don't Give Up music video. Yeah. Not the you know not to get sloppy with this, but I just rewatched that and noticed that they there's this great thing where he and Kate Bush are turning and as they turn and then they get to the bridge, the most like potent emotional part of the song, the sun and the moon behind them that have been slowly approaching reach eclipse and then the song like keeps going but the eclipse separates. Put them up. Uh, I don't know, but, uh, Ooh, yeah, the moon. Well, what's interesting, it's a very idiosyncratic. That looks nothing like the weight deck moon card. No, well, it but it still has a bug yeah. coming up from below. And there's a sword Oh, there is a bug coming from below. Capri yeah. is. And the gatekeeper's on it's, either it's side. Capri coming up out of the underworld. And that's in the weight deck? The yeah, well, it's, the, it's a cliff, and then a dog on either side. A dog and a wolf. And that's all in this card, too? Well, I mean. Well, Anubis, right? Anubis, Anubis is yep. in there, yeah. Oh, shit. Okay, so this is. Could also of, be Wepawet, though. I love how he inverts the, the traditional. Wepawet is a, okay. uh, one of the guides to the underworld, and it's a it's got a dog. And that's what that oh, looks like. And that's actually. Look at that. It looks like a Yanni right there, right? Or, <clears> yeah. No. So, so their whole thing with the moon was who built it? Because this right. shit is bizarre. It's precisely uh, 20. 7.932% the size of Earth, like mm -hmm. the diameter, mm -hmm. and also it or orbits Earth in 27.932 days. Right. Like, right. excuse me, what? Like, that doesn't, that right. shit doesn't happen. I know. Nowhere else do we see anywhere in the cosmos, in all of our, like, extraordinary telescopic power, do we, do we see anything even remotely like this? Yeah. So what the hell is going on? And what does it have to do with the fact that our planet is the only planet that has life, which is also a thing that we don't seem to be observing anywhere else. Right, right. And basically, their whole thing was, we came up with three options and we don't like any of them. They're like, it could be God, we don't like that. It could be aliens, we don't like that, because that just pushes the question back. I like both it. of those, though. <laughs> and, he's like, and, he, and he's like, and it could be, it like, could be future human beings through like some sort of quantum shenanigans yeah. where they have to create a history in which they exist. Yeah. And I was like, I feel like you guys are so close. No. You're so close. Because I, and I was talking about this with my buddies, we had hiked down from Taos, we'd hiked down the canyon to Stagecoach Springs down yeah. the Rio Grande, yep. one beautiful night in uh, August 2014, and there was a, um, it was the, the, the Leonid meteor shower? It was the, the one in August. Uh, yeah. And Sounds right. It might have been torrid. And, uh, anyway, uh, anyway it, it was a massive meteor shower. And that night I was talking about this and I said, I think that it's really all and none of those. I think that what it really is, is that as in Greg Egan's, science fiction novel Distress, when they figure out the theory of everything and it like loops back in time, the perfect description and understanding creates the universe yeah. in which it exists. It's like that the... Yeah, it's like a Mobius strip. A, yes, that a perfect mm -hmm. observation creates a perfectly recursive history in which it must, the observation is explained. Yeah. You know, and that basically what, what has happened is that every single person who has ever looked up and seen a solar eclipse you know, has looked up and seen the moon, is basically voting in quantum hyperspace for that to timeline exist. to exist, and oh, has no, like, and that, love that. Yeah, yeah, that we've basically created this history that we're like this channel yeah. of history that we're moving through by our like the retro voting, awareness of it. So that's voting that's in kind of like uh, cryptocurrencies, right? You have the blockchain, you should yeah. the blockchain to see if you see see the moon or not. Yeah, yes, and, that. and there's a Gnostic component to this because Dan Marimer in, of uh, EOS uh, mm -hmm. and BitShares and Billy Buterin of Ethereum mm -hmm. yep. were having this debate on Medium about the limits of crypto economic governance and Vitalik is saying, we can design a system in which we can in incentivize it such that all actors are, uh, that you're, you're going to guarantee good behavior and Dan Larimer said, no, you can't because there's always another ecosystem behind it. There's always a bigger economy that creates a deep state no matter what you do. 
and that you basically can only get, you know, you can only sort of hope that your players will act in favor of like doing the right thing like two out of three times, and you can sort of guarantee it's going to work most of the time. But he's like, but ultimately, there's always a sort of gnostic demiurgic sort of thing hanging out behind it, you know. Yeah, that you can't get, you, right. you can't factor it out, no. you know. And so I think that thing is the uh, the sort of like monstrous face of the omega point that we create observes itself and creates the history in which we're observing our own history, this weird, uncanny, perfect history that we can't comprehend. You know, that we're looking, I mean, that it's basically that it's all, it's, it's all happening, you know, and then it, we're just sort of at different points of it, you know, right. and, no. and it's, and it's coherent. It has like an internal integrity, you know, that it does actually have, there's like a, a, a supra narrative yeah. going on here. Um, and so at any rate, the second time I went out there, this is all stuff I came up with years later after the second time I went out in 2006. It was two weeks after that first time. The first time was a new moon, and the second time was a full moon. Right. And the second time, my friends, two, two guys that had not been there with me the, the first time, and I'd known for years, and you know, it's like take a bullet for you kind of friendships. Mm -hmm. I had told them, I was like, the last time I went out there, I saw a UFO. And actually, it wasn't the only one we saw. It was just at that point, later that night, when a UFO also, the first time, later that night, a UFO appeared, and all four of us saw it again. But everyone was so unsure of what they were seeing. Everyone was tripping so hard that it was mm -hmm. like, both of the women came home from that were like, I'm not saying shit about shit. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not putting my finger, I'm not putting my chip down on any mm -hmm. part of that roulette table. That's very common with UFO experiences. Yeah. Some people have a traumatic response and they, yeah. they want to well, deny it afterwards. Yeah. 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 It's, it's risk, how you want to approach the risk. I think that's a lot of how we... That's basically our experience in life. It's how do you want to choose to be exposed to all known risks. So I went out with these two other guys that I, I, you know, on some level I felt like were maybe like prepared to see UFOs. And um, well, you were tripping. <laughs> well, I was like, I mean, come on, you know, if you're gonna go in there. Um, so, and, you know, but I was like, but here's the thing: is that I can't, like, we can't assume anything about what the each other are seeing. Mm -hmm. When so, can we do the freeform Salus Ivan podcast? We'll get you guys in. in uh, we just, well, but freeform, we walk around in the place, oh. <laughs> broadcast live. All, yeah, we all right. Have, all right. Well, wouldn't that be wild? Here's yeah. four guys tripping, and this is what. Dude, I wish you could have seen me. me like, you're, 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 you're getting into some potential okay. dangerous feedback loops oh, by yeah. live streaming okay. it. <laughs> no, but like that in, in that idea. No, we're not live. Four cams and mics on four four tripping people that you can stitch back together in a studio and like yeah. give people excerpts is one thing. Yeah. Well, but then once, different, let, let once, you have, once you have a live I mean, audience, then, you know, it's, it's you're you're inviting the uncanny and okay. the weird shit in in a very particular way. Oh, I like way. that though. You know. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. The feedback from, warm, from everybody. As somebody who has worn a, uh, a camera right. in a room everybody. full of tripping people, here, come, or here comes electronics. Yeah. Then, uh, me and John are really into this idea. James Joyce had you know, the main character Finnegan's Wake was H C E, which one of the acronyms that that could be is "Here comes every everyone." Oh yeah, yeah. And so me and John have this idea that with electronic, electronic and telematic. Civilization. You, here comes everyone. You know, everyone has a comment on wow. a post, and yeah, so we're all right. dealing with HCE. All the time. Joyce was already living in the yeah. future when he wrote well, that. I mean, crazy. Yeah. So we're always dealing with this HCE character, which is everyone at the same time. You know, but also not because her eyes were green. You know, I love and that. like yeah. anything that the machine, that the singularity, like in right. in, in um, uh, Accelerando, like when human beings have sort of escaped from the Matryoshka brain. Uh, that's eaten the inner planets of the solar system, and they we're living as refugees in the outer planets. Spoiled. Right. The singularity is shooting out historical and fictional characters as living humans. That's right. like um, to Jeff them, Jeff and they're like, "What yeah. the fuck is this?" Like, they're like, "Are these? Are we being treated as an infection?" And these people are are like antibodies in a system that's like we can't understand. You know, it's like there's no other. I want to put an endorsement uh, to Jeff. Jeff Noon, the author of Vert and Pollen, and I think that um, Michael Garfield and you should get together and have a conversation. Okay, yeah. <laughs>
He wrote a book called Pollen, which is all about yeah. like um, people taking these like psychedelic compounds that tune them into like the um, like the agrarian body. You know what I mean? And all the like Greek myths are like these iconotypes in that space. It's really mm. interesting. Yeah, you can find them on uh, on like uh, Twitter and stuff. Anyway, I'm entirely happy to let parts two, three, and four of this be the subject parts, yeah, right. of another conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. Because, but yep. but I will say that I I think that the the takeaway here is that with each deepening stage of my personal history of encounters with the UFO, and I think it, it would be it, it'd actually be cruel not to give people part two, mm -hmm. which is that let's give them part two let's at each at each stage there is an increasing intimacy and a depth of understanding that we're not dealing with the other here. Well, yeah. that's like Lutley Strieber's whole thing with the UFO communion, you know, mm -hmm. that like these were like beings that we have to commune with, and he had this whole idea of like a sensual, even sexual relationship with these beings. It was, it was strange, oh. but but any Christian would say that's that's Satan, that's all old fashioned sa Satanism right there, you know. Right, because you're only allowed to have one kind of communion. Sleeping with the devil, you know, the you know the rituals mm -hmm. out and the, the witches, like that. They would say that Strieber was a witch, basically, you know. That's you know, well, right, because yeah. because they're Confucian about it, and they're saying you don't. Or it's like it's, used well, they are cause, <laughs> about because it's you're you're just taking the communion away for you're participating in the ritual, but it's it's not it's it's. It, not a completely empty ritual, it's still capable of quite a bit, but it, it's based on something else. Oh. But at any rate, the, the whole second thing about this was that I insisted on not leading the witnesses. So when lights started showing up in the sky that night, my friends and I were like, do you see that? Okay, yes, what do you see? You know? And we were actually enacting this protocol, the uh, Close Encounter uh, the 5, the Stephen Greer oh, talks about, yeah. where you actually sort of declare yourselves as a group to be a uh, planet planet ambassador, mm -hmm. you oh, know, and, wow, and, that's, and, oh, that's number five, okay, and invite right. in like a diplomatic interaction. So and so we did that. J. Allen Hynek came up with the uh, close encounter grades, right? So number yeah, I don't remember four would be like abduction, four, right? Four, no, let's see, yeah, the fourth kind is I guess abduction. The third kind would be contact with aliens, right? Close encounters with the first, first is you kind. see, second is, yeah. I guess, communication, maybe. communication yeah. of some kind. Damn it! I'm gonna Clo have to no well, close encounters with the third mm -hmm. kind was actual contact with the the occupants of the UFOs. Yeah, it was close encounters with the fourth kind would be the abduction thing, and then close encounters with the fifth kind would be kind of what you're talking about, which I think that's correct. You set yourself up as an ambassador. Right? I mean, I'm, I haven't heard that, before, but that sounds really yeah. Cool. Well, that's yeah. that was something specifically that I yeah. think was developed by right, the disclosure I mean, project. Because you kind of have to assume that if you're dealing with a transcendental intelligence, again, to go back to John C. Wright's sort of premise, you have to assume that, you know, that they're capable of being sort of invoked. I think you so, know? yeah. I mean, I've seen that happen a lot of times, right? And that's even what Jacques Vallée thought. Jacques Vallée was trying to connect UFOs to hermeticism. So, and yeah, so in a way, it's like you're the prophet. You, you say, okay, I'm the prophet, now give me the message. Well, you know, uh, Jason Reza Drojani, has a whole chapter in his book on uh, Prometheus and Atlas, all about the UFO phenomena, and he thought that, like, that it was UFO phenomena that creates the Old Testament. Oh shit! Yeah, there are actually yeah. there are actually uh, six types in his. Um, you, do, you should do that. Will be a whole other podcast, a UFO podcast. Yeah, and first, so there's actually three non-close encounters that Heineck listed: nocturnal lights. Daylight discs and a radar visual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then first is visual sightings, so seen by the human eye. The first three are, mm -hmm. you know, less than 500 feet away that show appreciable angular extension and considerable detail. Mm -hmm. This is according to Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Close encounter is the second kind. A UFO. Hi, Nick was uh, Valet's mentor. He was mm -hmm. he was an older scientist that Valet came from France to. To study with uh, Oh, Heineck. yeah. Okay, yeah. here we go. Close encounter is the second kind. A UFO event in which a physical effect is alleged. This can be interference in the functioning of a vehicle or electronic device, animals reacting, physiological events such as paralysis or heat or discomfort in the witness, or some physical trace like impressions in the ground, scorched or otherwise affected vegetation or a chemical trace. That second night, every time we saw them, the birds in the marsh around us started making a lot of noise. Part of the phenomenology. Yeah, yeah, right. I like that. Yeah. And what? And, and that night, there were so many more of them 
and they were different kinds. And like I saw some of the ones that I oh there was a there was a sound also like a boat propeller that the big ones seemed to make like they were like chugging through the sky. And I at this point you know I'd spent two weeks like studying uh, like aviation wing lighting and you know the, the silhouettes of different farm <laughs> planes and shit to make yeah. sure that I'm yeah. not just. You know, because it is, you know, you can have a lot of visual distortion under the influence of right. psilocybin, and it's, like, totally reasonable to, for me to maybe have mistaken something. But the only thing I could find that looked anything like what I saw that first night was in a, uh, a, a document from the 1700s. It was, like, a hand, like, it was a manuscript hand illustrations of, like, a clear thing with a big red light on front and a trail of white lights behind it. And I was like, bingo, that. yeah. bingo, that's yeah. a thing. Yeah. And that, specifically, that it flew in this sine wave pattern. Mm. And that it was accompanied by like a low humming, like a thrumming noise. A lot of UFOs do, uh, they do fall in a leaf uh, falling pattern, mm -hmm. UFOs. They have this weird, leaf, like well, the way a leaf falls. Mm -hmm. That's how a lot of UFOs are described as, as moving. So they're yeah, surfing. Possibly. Surfing, yeah. Some of the ones that I saw that second night uh, had, they, it almost looked like you were looking into a, a slide of pond water and all the little different critters swimming around in there. And like some of them had two lights up front, so you could tell that they were rotating in whatever this invisible medium was, and they were like spinning and then drifting. This is kind of freaking me out. And like, what, are, what are we talking about? And those things in particular. UFOs. Uh -huh. and, and, and those things in particular seemed to be like attracted to moonlight, and like the, I, those are ones. There's that some I, technology, man. That I did that not see them the first night this. during the, yeah. the new moon. Um, they seemed like they were sort of gathering, rather than traveling under their own power, like those that first class of things, yeah, yeah. it seemed like they were sort of absorbing moonlight and then using it to power themselves for a short distance. Some sort of beings, maybe. That's yeah. so intense. Yeah. 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 And, you know, we can end it there. Yeah. I mean, we that can wrap this up. I don't need to, I need to like say it. any more about my UFO experiences <laughs> for now. <laughs> that was good. But, you know... I, mean, I think that was, was very, very entertaining. Though. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for indulging me, guys. That was more that was than I usually talk. Dude, yeah. that was great, man. Yeah, yeah that was really show. entertaining. But, you know. Wait, I do have one last thought on The video truth is out there. Yeah. And I just forgot it. But not exclusively. It's also dancing in, in and out of us like a clown all the time. I love that. Yeah, right. <laughs> it is. Don't start oh, with this, the clown again. This is what I was going to say. So, we, since we've all had these sort of this, this UFO experience, <coughs> I think, I mean, I think that. The UFO thing is a shamanistic thing, so it's like we're all. I think we're all shamans. You know, that's why. That's why we're all coincidentally hanging out. I mean, and I think that whatever that phenomena is, it, it's initiating a new generation of people into yeah. something. You know, to the spiritual world. You know, so I like the term magicians. No, yeah, that's mm -hmm. my. Yeah, I mean, that's the term I like. Yeah, I'm, I'm into Crowley and stuff. So yeah, so I think it's. I think it's uh, sort of less. It's less fraught. With potential misunderstanding, is the mic off? Did we kill it? No, it's not. Oh, yeah. it's still gone. Okay. Yeah. So I still have to be careful what I say. <laughs> <laughs> Just I don't know. I've, I've seen you say some pretty crazy shit on no, Twitter. So. Yeah, no, I have. I, I'm prone to fits of angst and. Well, no, but I mean, I just mean Iliad's, uh, you know, idea of shamanism. Yeah. You know, all those because uh, if you look at Iliad's book and you study any abductee's uh, scenario, it's the same phenomenology. You know, any. Uh, Shamanistic initiation has the same; it has the same phenomena that an, an alien abductee goes through. You know, the, the body being taken apart by strange beings and putting back together again with objects inside. Yeah. John actually talks a lot about this in some of his lectures. Uh, about to, about um, the connection between alien abduction and shamanism. Shaman and yeah, well, that was yeah, yeah when I was first thinking about it way back when I did my first book. I was thinking that uh, there are so many similarities between like. What shamans describe when they get captured by these ancestor beings and they take them and pull out their body parts and replace them with crystals or mm. some superior metal or something. Alien. Yeah, and so they're, they're torn apart and rebuilt. And that's why they're invincible because they have this, it's like uh, the Wolverine character in the Marvel Universe has these shamanistic. Fuck, dude, that's they, awesome. they put metal inside of his body. That's totally shamanistic. But he's also tortured. Yeah. Is it torture? Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Well, yeah, the, yeah, but the shaman is tortured. The shaman is sacrifice. And the alien no abduction no game. phenomenon does sound a lot like that, you know, when they take them on board the ship and it's happening do in, stuff in, to in their bodies time, and yeah. add like, like metal implements. So the difference, the difference yeah. then is that we've graduated from the close encounters of the fourth kind, which are largely non consensual. To close encounters of the fifth kind, which are in, actually invited, 
where the seduction is like uh, actually in, in like initiated. But they were always by the human they being. were always invited by people who were doing magic, right? Magic was always about it, inviting these beings. And, well, right, but you know, but uh, these beings well, will sometimes catch you anyway. Yeah, so the magic invited. is all about a way of how you deal with unknown risks. So you got the unknown unknowns <laughs> and the known knowns and the unknown knowns and well, you know, the four options. Oh yeah, actually, another time, another friend brought up something interesting. So, so I was saying God is uh, basically our idea of the unknown, unknown, right? But he said no, it's actually the non unknowable, unknowable. Yes, <laughs> he's right. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> well, the God, the God head. Right? Yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, there's like, there's we don't know parts. what the fuck that yeah, is. Yeah, and, and our whole journey throughout life is how do we deal with all these unknown risks? Yeah. So that's actually this is the spot. This is the spot to end it because I think from here, normally. I like to end the show asking what what people kind of uh, what message they want to convey to the future, or possibly like what the best possible future they can imagine is. So, in general, uh, I'd love to hear each of you take a turn uh, saying something about, in light of all that we have said today, right. <laughs> in light of you know uh, the. The hypermodern uh, okay. evaporation of culture into the digital, in light of the apparent, persistent, and eradicable non-dual reality of the uh, hyperdimensional Harlequin, as somehow like a a perma feature, even if we're not aware of it, um, even if uh, you know, in light of the fact that we may. We may be involved in a time traveling conspiracy to create the moon, and in, in light of the fact that that uh, we that, covered a lot of that shadowfish, <laughs> yeah, we sure did. In, in light of the fact that Donkey Kong, that, yeah, the, 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 the babblefish might be a um, you know might sort of lead to a reverse snow crash in which everyone's speaking their own language, and we all become sort of like uh, cryptographic public private keys with uh, like brain implants that can communicate to each other. Um, what is the best, sort of like, wh what kind of best possible future do you envision given everything we know? Like given everything we sort of accept as the case? You know, where, uh, where is, where is the, the, the most reasonable sort of the intersection of like what you believe is actually possible mm -hmm. and like the best thing you can imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want us to answer that question? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess I can answer that, but I'll say that's almost the wrong answer to ask. It's uh, it goes back to uh, Taleb's idea of it. it's not about protecting the future, but about how you position yourself using heuristics so that you can experience the best future without risk of ruin. So, so rather than imagining kind of cool. like a static best future, it's really this flow. It's the you're living the Tao, you basically through this Wu Wei heuristic, where you don't actually have to know what to expect, but you just experience it, and you're actually pleasured by all the surprises, and just gotta make sure that you can calibrate the risks so that you don't have you don't die before you experience something interesting. Could it be? Okay. Could Don't you die before you experience something interesting? Could you say that, that, that then the, the best possible future you can imagine for our species is one in which we all are pleasured by surprise? Uh, yeah, so you're, you're kind of reincarnating in this like multiplicity of possibilities. Alright. What about you, Mike? So my, th my whole thing is that, you know, we, we think in metaphors, you know, so these are called um, cognitive and or conceptual metaphors. And I think that language, you know, if you look at any language, you realize that there are these metaphor landscapes that a language um, describes. And they're not just figures of speech. Even a figure of speech is an image, you know what I'm saying? So I don't think these things are just um, ways of speaking. They're actual realities that we inhabit. And I think that Part of what um, a poet does, let's say, you know, uh, is tunes in to some sort of force that invents new languages that actually is a, a modification of these conceptual metaphors. 
And, and, and it's all about adaptation. So we're trying to adapt these conceptual metaphors to survive in this contemporary age, you know. So the sort of hypermodern thing for me is really about like some sort of transformation of language where we we discover the right terms, but it's not really about the right terms either because there's no right or wrong. I'm just saying it's more in terms of metaphors, you know. So I'm I'm wanting us to be able to have a language that we can speak that actually gives us a sense of being and a sense of numinosity and, and dwelling in this hypermodern landscape so it's not this soulless, um, painful, empty experience that it is for a lot of us. Because we went through this um, contemporary art exhibit at the site uh, museum yesterday and we all left feeling really disorientated, which was kind of cool. It was the effect of the artist and, and he did a good job doing that. But, but it all left us really reminded of how much we've lost some connection to some deeper meaning that when we're all talking, we feel that there's this deeper sense to life, and that's not being captured in art right now, and it's not being captured in the ways that a lot of us are actually speaking. And I actually think it's the poet's job to kind of rediscover what, you know, in a new way, what the, what those uh, language forms are, what those metaphors are. So um, for me, it's just about experimenting with new new metaphors and, and new ways of using language, and uh, and I'll leave it at that. Mm. So would you say that it's, in some sense, it's like the best, the, 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 the good future is a future in which the poets have done their job by yeah, helping us, I mean, helping us uh, enjoy a surprise? Yeah. Well, the poet is the one who approaches the unknowns first, so he, he's exactly the one who basically right. is the canary in the coal mine when approaching these, I, I guess, intellectual risks. Yeah, well, I mean, this is like a Heideggerian idea too. That like it's that that language is not uh, informational. It's not supposed to signify something. Language is supposed to create an oral space, sound space that we inhabit, and that you know brings things to life. And that and that you know that's why he liked um, Helderlin you know, so much because he thought Helderlin was actually doing this for the the in between. He called it between this modernity and whatever is after modernity. You know. And so I think that we're in a space like that right now, and, and we need poets, and we need people like, like us who are describing this hypermodern thing, who can speak some sort of new language that can, um, you know, manifest the right kind of conceptual metaphors. And I don't want to use the word right. I, I'm, I'm upset that I keep using the word right, because it's not about being right or wrong. It's just that it's, the, it's metaphors that are complex enough to allow us to inhabit, or to, in a Heideggerian sense, dwell in hyper modernity, you know, mm -hmm. and so um, and so that's kind of what I'm interested in as a poet, just with my language games yeah. and stuff like that. So anyway, yeah. So that kind of reminds me of my critique of the intellectual dark web. So there's more to the logos than just reason and debate. It's more about there's multiple ways of using it to uh, basically do risk management. That's what it is. It's a medium for risk management. That's a, that's the logos, and when the poet or artist kind of paints this picture that doesn't look very rational, but that's actually part of the logos that you really need to navigate through chaos when there's too many unknown unknowns. That's the horizon that has to be, you know, collapsed into, you know, the... the uh, I sound like John right now. That's how John talks right now. There's a reason we're friends. I'm, I'm yeah. mimeticing, uh, copying John. Right <laughs> and that, that, uh, that selector is how Richard Doyle describes evolution. Mm -hmm. He says it's it's uh, a, s a searching of the information space mm -hmm. for the greatest possible entropy. Yeah. And so, you know, that uh, he says uh, attention consumes information, therefore uh, the role of attention consuming mm -hmm. uh, interspecies relationships to create an ever more complex ecosystemic metabolism mm -hmm. is is like what Pierre Teilhard de Chardin and all oh, wow. these other thinkers saw as this self-evolving okay, process that eats everything. Mega man. I knew you noticed this down because the idea I was working on is called metabolic existentialism and trying to work out like basically combining uh, Spangler with McLuhan and uh, and I guess like complex systems to try to figure out 
how do you do meta history? Well, read Darwin's Pharmacy. This no. will be his article in the Hypermoderby Anthology we're putting together. Yeah, because Darwin's Pharmacy is you, is the legit. Yeah. I think yeah. it's it's you like the sounding shot. That, yeah. yeah. So like right. another aspect of it is my my presentation on uh, how do you understand value and for like part one of it, which is on mythology, I said uh, mythologies are the most valuable signals which survived after stressors filtered out the noisy data over time. Their meanings have been encrypted by black box algorithms of the unconscious mind into symbolism. <laughs> and when I tweeted this, Gibson or uh, like Nassim Taleb school. actually liked this comment. Sweet! Yeah, so I guess I'm on the right track. Yeah, just, awesome, just keep your trolls high. You know? yeah. John, what about you? Uh, well, okay, here's what I would say is, in a, in a certain sense, it doesn't matter. It, it's, it's like, um, <laughs> the spirit is always with us, no matter what happens. The, it's, it's not, we're just, we're, we think we're the origin of our actions. We get ideas in our head, concepts, ideas, paradigms, and we think, oh, I have this idea, I'm effectuating this, and it's my own free will, but it's more likely that you're participating in a larger project that has to do with a relationship to the metaphysical other world, and that they're involved with all of this no matter what happens. And so access to that spiritual world is always there. It's like Gebser's ever-present origin. You know, the, the Ursprung is always there, and it's always accessible, and there's always going to be new ideas coming out of that ever-present origin. Yeah, that's what you know? they do in meditation. And those ideas will code uh, for new cultural, cultural formations ideas. All, all we need to do is, is just trust the process. It's like Heidegger's idea of Gelassenheit, you know, releasement. Let it go. Trust being. Listen to being. Let it go. Hear what it has to say. And follow that. And it's mm -hmm. not, you know, everything that happens is utterly something that needs to happen. And we just need to have faith in these processes. I love that, man. The, the, it'll all work out. That's awesome. And on that note, as you're saying this, I think it's just so delicious to note that I went through that whole thing about the UFOs to get to a point that I was going to make eventually about the mythic significance and inevitability of limitation and constraint and like the moment that confinement, confinement yeah. Yeah. says okay this is necessary so I think that's actually the perfect place to uh, lock this conversation off yeah, this, this, is, this has been a blast. Man. Yeah, so the constraint is actually, there's, there's more. We have to do this. Which is, uh, He's like, no, wait a minute. I was just getting started. Yeah, I so, was my fucker. So, so <laughs> here's, I, yeah. I went through this whole conversation without even bringing up Lev Shestov. So Shestov, he wrote this book called Athens and Jerusalem, and he's all about how faith is actually the way you overcome dogma because... It's like a way of you going beyond the necessities. Everyone's constraining themselves with these necessities. And he said, no, you should be open to these black swan events. And you open up your consciousness, and basically that's how you deal with risks. And the, he had this one um, article, not article, he had this one passage, it's like an aphorism in his book, All Things Are Possible, about these fish. So he had... Uh, the story is like these predatory fish and these little fish, right? They put a they put a little glass screen between them, so every time the predatory fish wants to eat the small fish, it would just run into the glass. Right. But then yeah. they remove the glass, and the uh, and they think that barrier is yeah, still they, there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we have to tempt that barrier, and that process is basically faith, and that's also uh, how you get to technological innovation. That's yeah, a great that's really place cool. to call it. Thanks. That was great. Thanks, you guys. This was my Thank you. funnest conversation that I've ever had. Ever. Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. Future Fossils is part of the MindPod network, along with Third Eye Drops, The Astral Hustle, Synchronicity Podcast, and an oodle of other fascinating programs. I encourage you to go to mindpodnetwork.com and subscribe to them all. And stay tuned because we have some awesome episodes coming up on future fossils. But for now, may your now be exquisite, long, and wonderful.